order. On behalf of the committee, can I welcome our witnesses uh, this morning? Um, we are very grateful to you for giving up your time, some of you again, and some of you for the first time, uh, to uh, enlighten our deliberations. Can I welcome Dr. Kirsty Hughes, Director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations, uh, Professor Catherine Barnard, Professor of EU Law at the University of Cambridge, Sam Lowe, Senior Research Fellow, Centre for European Reform, and Henry Newman, Director uh, of Open Europe. Now, we have, not surprisingly, as always, a lot of ground to cover, and colleagues' succinct questions and succinct answers would be really helpful to enable us to get through everything. Please do not all feel under an obligation to answer every question, and some questions may be directed to uh, you as uh, individuals. Now, the first question I wanted to put was on the troublesome question of the backstop and how and when it can be ended. Now, the House of Lords uh, EU Select Committee concluded earlier this month that in the event of uh, what they, I think, described as an intractable dispute between the UK and the EU over whether the backstop should be brought to an end, the UK could invoke arbitration. And the Attorney General subsequently indicated in his published advice uh, that arbitration could indeed be used for this purpose, while the government's legal paper said that going down this route would depend on there being a clear lack of good faith on the part of the EU. So the question is, do you think that arbitration would be available under the terms of the withdrawal agreement to try and deal with the situation in which the UK and the EU had a different view about whether the backstop should be ended? Professor Varad, you were nodding, so I think I'll come to you first. <laughs> um, so we're looking at um, Article 20 of the protocol. Yep, we're looking we at the fact that uh, Article 20 says nothing about uh, any remedial provision. Uh, there is a problem because um, Article 14 of the protocol does provide uh, remedies and you could make a lex specialis <coughs> argument and say, well, if that is the only remedy that is specified, then those are the only remedies available and they only apply to limited provisions of the backstop. But I don't find that argument compelling because, one, it's not very practical, and two, you could also make the point that Article 14.4 deals with the specific issues, which are very technical issues. It doesn't deal with your broader point. So then the question is, can the arbitration clause, i.e. Uh, Title um, 3 of Part 6, be applied to Article 20? Now, I think there's an argument that it can um, because uh, the Joint Committee uh, and the Specialised Committees can refer matters to the Joint Committee about uh, issues of in implementation and interpretation. And so I tend to take the view, and I, which uh, the House of Lords Committee does as well, that uh, the uh, general remedies provisions apply, but there's a problem. And the problem is, one, legal. What happens if... Um, there's a breakdown and neither side can agree, not because of bad faith, but because there is a very different perspective. There's good faith on both sides, but a very different perspective about whether the backstop is still necessary. And that, that point wasn't really dealt with by the government. I still think it would still have to go to arbitration, which brings us to the next political come legal point. Can arbitration essentially decide on something as deeply political as whether the backstop is still necessary? But I think the fact is, as we know, arbitrators, courts have to trespass on ultimately quasi-political issues. We've seen that with the Whiteman case. And so I think it should be able to go to arbitration. Then the question is whether arbitration actually embraces the substantive issue. Has things broken down to such an extent what to do about it? Or merely the procedural issue, how do we get to the next stage? And that's not clear at all. So you might end up having to go to arbitration to work out the, the powers of the arbitrators. Well, I, I just wanted to pursue that I bet that's that really last, cheered you up, hasn't it? <laughs> you know, that last point, because if, if, say, the UK said, we think that... Uh, this dispute about whether the backstop should be ended does come within the provisions for arbitration in the agreement and therefore it should go to the arbitrators. The issue itself, 
And the EU side says, no, we don't think it falls within the powers. Is there a provision for that question of whether it does or does not fall within uh, to then go to arbitration to decide whether it can? The substantive issue can then go to arbitration, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And of course, the, answer's, the answer is no, because we don't even know whether the arbitration provisions can apply at all to Article right. 20. And there's a further problem. If you look at the text of Article 20, it also envisages a situation um, where um, the, the decision is that the backstop is only needed in part, not in whole. And then that creates further issues about who will actually decide that. Now, it feels a political decision, but if the two sides, if that is broke, if the two sides can't agree on that point, how do you get it resolved? And I think essentially that's where arbitration must eventually kick in. But the arbitration is, then the question is whether the arbitrators can come up with some sort of process about how to deal with this, or whether they will actually decide the substantive issue. Okay. That is very helpful. Does anybody want to add to that or express a different view? If not, the second question I've got is this. The Prime Minister went to the Council last weekend seeking some kind of reassurance on the, this question that I've just asked you about, and none was forthcoming, but she says that discussions are continuing. We know, however, that no special council has been scheduled. The next ordinary council is in March. Is there a mechanism available by which the EU could agree, I don't know, a right round, conference call, whatever it is that doesn't involve the leaders meeting in one place, that might sign off? And I'm talking about the process. Is there a process by which the EU could sign off something which could then be transmitted to the UK government? Is there any precedent for them doing it without, on a major issue like this, having to call a special council? So this is a procedural question. Can anyone think of anything? I mean, yes. I, I, I'll, I'll, have Hughes, a go. I'll have a go, but um, I'm not sure is the answer, but I, okay. I, I'm not aware of any precedent. And I would think normally if you think of when Ireland or Denmark had second referenda, for instance, and so to stop a, stop a stalemate <coughs> over a treaty, protocols or additional clauses or reassurances, as you know, in various forms were given, um, there were European councils. Um, whether it's open to, I mean, obviously we've seen in the last year and a half and longer Presidents Juncker and Tusk make statements, you know, uh, with a European Council, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of a, a process that would okay. allow you to do that. Mr. Uh, Lowe. To add to that, I'm not sure, but it, but it is a political question, and, and just from from the EU side, there was always the feeling that they were not going to do anything pr this year. Yeah. They want, to, to, to be honest, they don't actually feel that Parliament's actually read the text yet, so they want to give a bit more time for it to sink in and for the domestic argument to play out. But, but if they want to do something in January, they will find a way. And I think that it is possible that when we hit January that there are discussions in which, and discussions start to happen about how tweaks could be made. I don't think anything substantive could be changed but clarifications and the like, but nothing will be announced yet. Okay, that, that is very helpful. Now, one suggestion has been to try and approach the backstop problem from the other direction, um, because it seems pretty clear that there is a reluctance to put an end date on the backstop, and the idea has been floated that you could seek to put a start date on the new trade relationship and as long as the start date for the new trade relationship was before the end of December 2022 then you could argue you can extend the transition to December 2022 if the new relationship is going to come into effect before then ergo the backstop will never be used now there are clearly difficulties in trying to agree a legally binding start date, because it depends how the negotiations go and what the UK wants. But do you think there's anything in that, or is it a vain hope? Now, Mr Newman. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I don't really understand the difference between the two particularly. I mean, obviously, there's, there is a yeah. difference, but I think, you're, I think there's a danger from the UK side as well in setting a fixed date to end the backstop. And obviously, that's what the Prime Minister tried to seek uh, at the Council meeting uh, just last week, but I think that was, that was broadly a mistake. Uh, first, firstly, because I think it was something the, 
the uh, union would never give us. Um, and secondly, because I think if you do that, you create a new negotiation cliff edge that you then rush towards and take actual power away from uh, the UK negotiating team. So I, I don't think they're going to give us that, and I don't think it's a very sensible approach. I think there are things that you can clearly do, as Sam was saying, to offer greater clarity. Um, there are things as well that wouldn't necessarily change the balance of how the backstop operates, but would make a substantive difference on the UK side. So, for example, creating a role for the Stormont institutions, that could be done through the, the operation of the Joint Committee without changing, ultimately, anything in the balance between the, the UK and the EU side on that Joint Committee, but would give reassurance that the commitments that were made in December of last year uh, by the UK side, or by both sides in the Joint Report, were being met. So I think there are things you can do like that. Just one final point on an earlier question sure. on arbitration. I mean, obviously, good faith has become a, uh, an element of some recent international disputes. I think the UK was taken to the International Court of Justice over our, um, whether we were negotiating in good faith or under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So there is some precedent for use of these sort of points in international dispute resolution. Um, and I think we might be able to get some greater clarity on the operation of the exit mechanism through some sort of interpretive declaration. Policy Exchange has done a report on this recently, which I think was interesting and provide some thought. But equally, there are dangers if you if you created some sort of parliamentary lock on the operation of the backstop. If you go too far in that direction, you could end up with a situation where if an amendment like that was passed, Parliament hasn't actually ratified the treaty that we would need to ratify. That's very interesting. Yes, Professor Bonner. I think I would say that um, on the point about uh, some sort of uh, comfort declaration, the most likely form would be a decision of heads of state and government. Now, this is a particular jargon term. I accept it's very unappetising jargon, but it was what was used when um, Denmark um, voted against the Maastricht Treaty. It's when Ireland voted against the Lisbon Treaty. And it was what was being used essentially for the um, Cameron 2016 um, renegotiations. And that was going to be an international agreement. It was going to be registered um, as a uh, internationally binding text. And it would at least stand separate and independent from the withdrawal agreement, which the EU has made very clear that they're reluctant to open. So it seems to me that that's the most likely way forward. It would be an intergovernmental agreement. But I think they would, the idea that they could do it on a quick email circular seems extremely unlikely. I think they would have to, to, to meet. Okay. Uh uh, just, I mean, just briefly on the idea of the date, I think it's very hard for obvious reasons to put a legally binding date when, when you haven't even begun the trade negotiations, when the UK is not yet a third country, uh, and it certainly couldn't include ratification, obviously. But having said all that, to put, to put an intention politically as part, as part of attempting to offer a, a political route through perhaps is possible. I, I'm, I'm not sure if it damages the UK's bargaining power. I suspect it would maybe limit the EU's bargaining power. I think the EU is going to be in an extremely strong position from April if, if we leave on, on time and if we leave. Um, so, so I'm, you know, I, I'm open as to which side politically would actually want that and benefit from it. Okay. Now, Mr. Ne uh, Mr. Lowe. Uh, to add to Catherine's uh, point, one of the issues the UK has in this is I think the EU will be willing to help with further declarations and the like on the condition that they are convinced that it would allow the Prime Minister to, get, to pass the withdrawal agreement through Parliament. And at the moment it's not clear to them what would help her do that. So until she can clearly articulate a route through Parliament and what they can do to assist her, um, it seems very unlikely that they will do any of these things, but I would then agree with Catherine that this, what, what, was, what, was, what was laid out, um, is a likely route they would go about. Okay, it. that's very helpful. Now we're going to explore, explore the, the subject in more detail in the questioning, but I want each of you in a sentence, and I mean a sentence, <laughs> when someone says to you, managed no deal, what, what is your reaction? What would you say about it? Um, my reaction is, is the same as the EU27 reaction, that there's no such thing as a managed no deal. Okay. 
Agreed, agreed managed no deal requires bi it's bilateral agreements and the EU has come out very clearly and said no bilateral agreements we will do unilateral decision making which helps the EU 27 they said that in their communication last month okay Mr Lowe it's a political slogan of no substantive worth okay Mr Newman I think there could be some substantive things the UK can do to, uh, unilaterally to mitigate the effects of no deal in certain areas but ultimately uh, and that's indisputable. But I think the over, overall, unless you can agree side agreements, there's going to be very significant disruption. Very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Emma Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, we know from the recent EU uh, Council meeting that obviously the EU has other issues and other challenges that it faces. I wonder if you could comment on where Brexit ranks in the EU's priorities. I mean, um, I was in Berlin two weeks ago um, and was told it certainly wasn't in the German government's top five priorities. Um, I, think, I think it was in the top ten. Um, you know, you're obviously right. Um, there are other major challenges internally and externally. How to handle external migration um, carries on as a, a major issue. Eurozone reform, growth of populism, um, and every country also has their own internal challenges, whether we look at, you know, Merkel or Macron, there are different issues going on. So I think that does obviously impact on the politics of Brexit. Um, one way or another, they want this over. Um, certainly in Berlin, what I heard was, you know, it was just before the December 11th, they were expecting that vote to proceed, they were expecting it to fail, they weren't very scared about that, if I can put it that way, because they thought it was very important that it did move on, that time is running out. Um, so, so yes, there are many, many other issues, um, and uh, I've given the example of Germany, but I think that goes across the board. I, I was in Brussels yesterday not talking about this as such, I was talking about social policy, and I was struck that nobody in the room really was interested in Brexit at all. I, I think we should differentiate between member states and the EU. In different mm. member states, Brexit is a sideshow because it's not just a case of EU issues to think about, it's also their domestic mm. issues which, which, which are the priority. But I think actually at the EU level there's a lot of talk about it not being that high up on the priorities, but in, in reality it is. It's, it's, it's fundamentally important and it's something that they're definitely concerned about. If it's number one priority, probably not, because it's certainly top five. Mm. I agree with exactly what Sam says. I think it's, um, there's a sort of certain, uh, I don't know what the, exactly what the right expression is, but there's a, there's a desire to sort of show that how little they're paying attention to, to Brexit that you often see in, in public pronouncements uh, at European Council meetings and so on. But clearly, this is a serious issue. The uh, embassies here are very, very engaged in it for obvious reasons, spend a lot of time on it. They get very senior visitors who are very interested in it. If I speak to uh, people in uh, Heads of, in the offices of heads of government of other European countries, they're very interested in what's happening here. Now, it may be that they feel that they've settled the deal um, and they they're now understand that this is a political process in the UK as to whether that deal is ratified or not, but I, don't think, I wouldn't say that they're not interested. Okay, thank you. That's really useful. Um, given that it's in the EU's interest as well as our interest to avoid a no-deal scenario, how willing would the EU be if the UK were to ask to extend Article 50, and what circumstances? Shall I? You go first, All right. Um, I don't think the EU would be willing to extend Article 50 just because the UK government and parliament had failed to decide whether they wanted Brexit and what sort of Brexit yeah. they wanted. So I, I think the message has come from various quarters in the EU that an extension may be possible. For instance, if for some reason there was going to be a general election and if it couldn't be held within, within the time limit to the end of March, if there was going to be a further referendum on the deal. Um, but, I think, but I think there's a serious reluctance to, to extend just to allow the inconclusive debate and stalemate that exists at the moment to go on. I, I think also a number of people, commentators and others, have been rather too... Um, optimistic about how simple it may be to get an extension of Article 50. Obviously, it requires unanimity. Um, again, I, I've certainly heard when I was in Berlin, you know, it's going to take time. You would expect um, member states, perhaps, to come with some demands. They may not get them, but, you know, you can imagine the flashpoints, whether it's fish or Gibraltar or money or something else. And if you take the example of 
if there was a decision to have a, a, another vote, another a referendum on the deal, um, and given that we've got the Whiteman judgment, so you know, if you were to have another vote and if that was to be remain in the UK, you could unilaterally revoke, at the point of extension, the EU kind of would know this is potentially its last bargaining power on that scenario. So, and, and some, you know, there is some debate about do all EU 27 member states, do they want to help on, in the case of it being requested? I think it depends what it's being requested for. For a people's vote, they will want us back. Um, so I think it can't, it can't be done just because the sort of stalemate we're in at the moment continues. I, I, would, I would agree with that and, and say the only time I think it can be extended if, there's, if, they, if they determine that the reason for extension is, is in their interest. And the only time from my discussions with, say, the Article 50 task force team on the other side or, or member states where I've had it acknowledged that Article 50 could be extended was to allow for domestic ratification processes. So, so on the UK side, but also on, on the EU side. That's not to say there aren't other reasons why it could be extended, right. but it gives an idea as to the sort of um, reason they would allow it for. And, mm -hmm. and that makes sense. But it also brings home a point that I don't think has been fully appreciated in the British debate, which is there is actually only really one deadline. We, talk, we have lots of other deadlines, and I realise that there's domestic parliamentary deadlines to consider as well in, in, in a way. But if an agreement is signed at one minute to 11, uh, because, we, because it's, it's not midnight, obviously, um, then, and it's one that the both sides think that they could pass, then time will be made domestically to allow it to happen. And I think talk of earlier cliff edges uh, lead people to miss this. My understanding from speaking to people in the Commission um, and elsewhere was that there were two broad circumstances where Article 50 extension would be considered, although exactly as was just said, it would probably require unanimity unless QMV was extended there as well, but the, um, which has its own problems. But if that was the case, um, we would... Uh, they would only be for general election or for referendums. So mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been listening to Labour front benches talking about extending Article 50 uh, and going back to renegotiate more. That's simply not on offer. It's magical thinking. for unanimity because Article 53 says very clearly it's unanimity. Um, there is um, just two other points. One is that there's quite a lot of discussion about whether you can pause Article 50. Um, and Article 50 doesn't envisage any possibility of pausing. Um, the only thing it does envisage is that it could be possible to delay the implementation date of the withdrawal agreement, which is one rather overlooked dimension of the Article 50, um, paper, uh, Article 50 uh, provision. Um, but pausing, I think it's unlikely, and I think it's even more unlikely in the light of Whiteman. Because Whiteman says, albeit in the context of revocation, I agree, but, um, but Whiteman says it's got to be an un unequivocal and unconditional decision. And a pause doesn't seem to me to be unequivocal or unconditional, because by definition a pause is just that. Sorry, we should have said that we come up against a structural bump, bump problem quite quickly with the European elections in May, and that's obviously a big concern on the Commission side as well. Well, I wanted to ask you very quickly about that, if you would let me, Chair. Um, to what extent... Is that a constraint? I know it's a difficulty, but if, for example, um, we got close to the end of February, March, and the Prime Minister and Parliament said we wanted a general election, or there was a decision, decision to go ahead with a, a second referendum, um, how far beyond the March 29 deadline could, could we extend? And could there be some temporary solutions to the European Parliament elections problem? For example, we used to send MPs uh, to Brussels as MEPs uh, in the past. Could that be a, solu a temporary solution while a referendum or a general election was taking place? I mean, I think, um, I think if it was a general election, I mean, general election doesn't need so long that you need to extend it long enough to cause a problem in terms of the European Parliament elections, because you're going to be asking for that extension, presumably by at least, hopefully by the start of March, not on the 28th of March. Um, for a second referendum, that's obviously d more difficult, because there are different views on how long it takes, or whether it, um, the Constitution Unit at UCL said 22 weeks. Um, 
I maybe Catherine has, has clearer legal views than me on what you can do in terms of whether you'd actually have to hold European Parliament elections in the UK, whether you could sort of nominate existing MEPs to carry on, but that could potentially be open to legal challenge in terms of whether that's actually allowing people fully to exercise their democratic rights. But as you say, I think it's a difficulty. It's not kind of a, a complete veto-like block, but it, but it, it does not make the EU's decision any easier, they find it very difficult to, to factor that in because already those European Parliament elections are looking pretty difficult for the EU in terms of combating okay. some of the right-wing parties. That's very helpful. Can, can I just pursue, uh, before I call Andrea Jenkins in, the point you just made, Professor Barnard, because uh, Section 3 of Article 50 says the treaty shall cease to apply to the state in question from the date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement or failing that two years after the notification. Now, what if one side wants the date of entry to be 29th of March and the other side says, well, actually, we'd now like it to be September or December next year? What, what happens then? Because it seems to me that Article 50 is silent on that question because the need for unanimity uh, would appear to apply to the two years, but not to the date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely on that, and um, I think that's a problem. I think what we it was likely that the EU side would decide it by qualified majority voting, because it would be part and parcel of the Article 50 withdrawal agreement. But I think it, 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 it would require agreement on both sides. You're absolutely right. It would, to, to, to pick another date yeah. for the date of entry. And, of course, you're already up against the problem of tampering with the text of the withdrawal agreement, which is, yeah. is acquiring the status right. of being written in stone. But it is, it is a possibility which is built into the text of the extremely skeletal text of Article 50 as a potential other way of buying some time. OK, that's very helpful. Andrew Jenkins. There. Um, the chair's covered some of these, but I just want to delve a little bit deeper. So, um, what would the immediate response be from the EU27 if the House of Commons votes down um, the deal? Um, start with you, Catherine. Um, well, if uh, th th they will say uh, virtually nothing publicly, so say it's a domestic constitutional matter to be resolved internally. Um, what, what about internally? What, what do you think? Internally within yes. the UK yeah. and, no, and no, uh, within the EU, what, what do you think their um, reaction would be internally? Will it put, you know, put panic into them, thinking we're heading towards WTO? Or no, because they, they've already factored in to a high extent that there will be, to a large extent, that there will there is, an, uh, there is a good chance for no-deal Brexit. And, of course, oh. they've, been, they've been planning for it for some time. They put out the, the technical notices have been around for best part of a year, and now they've also published the <coughs> communication um, on how they're going to deal with sort of the, them, so them taking more than we are, really. <laughs> unilateral decisions. Yeah. Of course, it's going to affect them more disparately than for us it will be a concentrated effect. Okay. Um, I, th I think the immediate... I, I think Catherine's right that, 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 that some of this is priced in, and I think one of the things that is priced in is that Parliament rejects it first time round, so it wouldn't necessarily be a surprise. I, I, we okay. were expecting a vote yes. some weeks back and, it, and the large expectation was yeah. that that was going to be okay. voted down. But in terms of the immediate reaction, it, it, it could go two ways. One is to wait, yeah. because in time has always been the EU's ally with all of this. That There's a feeling that the closer we get to March, the more uh, tangible the effects of no deal are, because actually some of them will be felt before we leave, just because mm -hmm. decisions will, will be made and, and things will start to be priced in, um, the more likely it is that Parliament could change its mind. There is also the chance that, of course, if they think it's been rejected for reason X, Y and Z, and these are things that maybe we could help the Prime Minister with clarifications on, that that will come into play the closer we get to March. But that wouldn't happen immediately. Okay. There would be a breath. Um. Henry or Kirsty, have you got anything to add? Well, I think it just depends on, on the, the, the size of the defeat. I think there's been sort of different, several different stages. Yeah. When the deal was first closed, I think the expectation was that this would be passed. And I think there was some, a surprise among certain uh, member state capitals when I explained the extent of, uh, of the feeling against elements of the deal. Um, so perhaps that wasn't initially very well factored in, but as Sam was saying, I think now uh, the extent of opposition is very priced in. It would depend on the scale of the defeat, and I think they'd expect the deal to be put back to the Commons 
several times, uh, potentially. But if there were discrete areas, then I'm sure they'd be happy to look at those as long as it didn't cut across something fundamental in the text. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't entirely agree with that. I mean, just going back to being in Berlin just a few days before the 11th of December vote at the point when that was expected to be held and, and probably to be lost, um, my interlocutors there were expecting the process then to move on. They, they actually, quite interestingly, we were not expecting to step in at, at the European Council a day or two later and try and rescue the deal. They, they, their reading of British politics at the time, um, and that's obviously also influencing, you know, they're following that to see what's possible and to see what is then in their interests. And, and they thought, as of two weeks ago, we know that's a long time at the moment, in politics that, that would probably move on to being a choice between Norway plus so-called and, and another referendum. Um, whether even today, two weeks later, that would still be how they read it, I don't know. I mean, obviously, if it was a close defeat, they might see the, the best route possible to, to have another vote. But I don't so think do they not, does the EU 2070 <coughs> say they're not, they don't, don't take no deal seriously? They think that we're either going to go with Norway or... Um Second referendum, is that I think they think, you know, that they're, they're making serious unilateral preparations. I okay. think they're amazed and appalled at the state, to be frank, of UK politics. And so while, while they think it's unlikely, they certainly wouldn't rule it out and therefore they have to prepare for okay. it. To, 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 come back, to come back on that slightly, uh, there was never any intention to offer anything in the European Council following if, if, if the deal was voted down. I agree with that. There, was, there would have always been a pause and, 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 and a break. But on, on the answer of is it Norway or no deal or, or the like, Norway is a second order question. Hmm. So it's, it's the future, that's to do with the future relationship. The first order question is, is how do we leave? And on that, hmm. or do we leave? So there's three options. There's no deal. There's a deal that looks substantially like the one on the table, potentially tweaked, let's not rule it out. And then there's remain. Those are the three options. And the second order question is, what does the future relationship look like? And I think there is probably scope to tweak the political declaration if it was deemed to help the Prime Minister to do so, because it doesn't bind either side. So if, if actually clarifying potentially that a Norway-type solution was the ambition, if that was deemed by the Prime Minister to be helpful in Parliament, would they consider that? Perhaps. Okay. But you could also argue that the other way, you could say it, or the other way, or a Canada-style solution, because the withdrawal agreement as it stands leaves open nearly all future relationships with the caveat that if you want a Canada-style relationship, it can only be for Great Britain, because Northern Ireland will have to have supplementary provisions. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned in an earlier question that um, you know, the UK have not stated um, what further changes they'd want to the withdrawal agreement to make it palatable to Parliament. In your expert opinions, um, if you were the UK, what would you be asking for? So, well, it's, it's, it could, because it's a very political question in that I don't know what would help with Parliament okay. as a whole. I know what would maybe help with individual groups Mm. within Parliament, but if the aim is to build consensus, then I'm not sure. I'm still, and, and, and this, this obviously won't, won't please everyone, but it is still possible, I think, to tweak the withdrawal agreement if you were to want to remove the whole UK element of the backstop and revert to the Northern Ireland-specific backstop. I think that is something the EU would actually countenance okay. because the UK-wide customs union element was a concession on the mm. EU side. It was something asked for by the UK that the EU didn't want. Mm. So I think that's possible. But does that help in Parliament? No. I'm not sure. I've got a few sort of specific points. I think, first of all, um, a role for Stormont institutions is definitely something the UK could achieve. And that could be done in a combination of domestic um, legislation, but also some degree of international agreement. Um, secondly, I think I would try to seek some greater clarity over um, the circumstances in which the UK, the EU would be able to impose uh, customs tariffs on the UK uh, under the protocol, uh, and whether those would could ever apply to customs traffic between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, So I think that's clearly unacceptable. Um, and the third area would be some degree of interpretive declaration or otherwise on the exit mechanism uh, for, from the backstop, and that's again referred to the, the, the policy exchange paper on this was excellent. There are various other things that I would have loved to have seen. For example, uh, on the arbitration panel, there's a referral to the European Court for obvious reasons on EU law matters. Uh, why didn't we seek a referral to the UK Supreme Court on matters of UK law? Uh, but I think you've got to, you know, better to focus on a, a few discrete things that are actually potentially achievable. But I think that a, a Stormont lock, um, a 
uh, role, assurances on internal customs matters within the UK and clarification on the exit provisions would be my top three. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think as, as I guess Sam said, it, it, it's obviously a political question yes. in the sense of, you know, does Parliament want Brexit and does it know, can it agree what sort of Brexit it wants? Because then you can obviously, you can you could change the political declaration quite substantively, I think. I mean, people talk about tweaks, but actually it is open to, you know, you could have a Canada plus in that, you could have a... A Turkey plus, I've called it. Um, EU certainly think you could have a Norway plus there. I mean, you maybe take out the sentence on the UK won't have have free movement. So, and whether in doing that there might be one or two sentences you want to change in the withdrawal agreement, then it can happen that way. I think. I mean, as it stands, obviously the backstop and the basic customs union excludes fisheries uh, products from from the customs union. So I don't think. We all know how sensitive fish is and there's interests on both sides and it's a very tough one. So I certainly don't think there will be any acceptance of, of avoiding customs tariffs in that, in that area. Thank you. Um, final question, if that's okay, um, Chair. Um, Emma's already touched on no deal. Um, but I'd just like to ask, finally, um, if we go to no deal, um, how will it affect um, the EU 27 countries? We've, all, we've heard a lot of rhetoric coming about Britain, but what about the EU 27? Henry, to begin with? Uh, negatively, obviously, but it would also I mean, it would affect both sides very negatively. I think, I think there's a very big difference between a, trying to go for a no-deal scenario now, a deal is on the table, and the status quo before a deal had been agreed. Because so I think if it had been in a position, say, of a month ago, where we'd simply been unable to reach agreement on uh, the backstop applying in customs terms beyond Northern Ireland, and therefore we were faced with a scenario where we had to accept a withdrawal agreement that would have created a customs border down the Irish Sea. Yeah. I think it would have been much easier in those scenarios to, uh, to, to hold out as a, as a UK and say that we can't agree this and therefore yeah. we need side agreements to mitigate but, but, some of that damage. With respect to what I mean, Henry, is say we get to the 29th of March, uh, it's no deal and nothing else, nothing else has been agreed. I just want to understand what does it look like from the EU? How will it affect them if we go to no deal? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm sure it'll be very problematic, but I just think that's... In, a, in, in what respect, then, is what I'm trying to understand? Uh, I mean, it will affect, I think it'll affect their budget, it'll affect their trade, it'll affect, uh, it'll, it will, by definition, mean... it be quite mean, significant, right? By definition, will mean security and foreign policy relations are also affected, but I think the... But I expect that we'll see greater EU27 solidarity in that, those circumstances, and emergency measures come into effect that will mean that prospects of getting any sort of UK agreement anytime soon uh, with, with our biggest trading partner will be far harder. OK, um, so will it, um, will it be worse for the EU27 no deal than it will be for Britain? No, I think it would be, I mean, I think it would be very bad for certain countries within the 27, but I think the, the effect on the UK in, of the disruption would be more concentrated. I think the UK and the 27 in the medium term could obviously survive a no-deal scenario, could survive trading on uh, with tariffs, but the, the, the problem is not the tariff element of this. Yeah. Problem, okay. problem is much wider. Right, thank you. you, you sorry. So, so, again, I don't want to look at the British element. Mm -hmm. There's so much out there. I just want to look from the EU so, element. So if please. you look at the exposure from a GDP perspective for the other member states, yes. no, uh, Ireland, of course, is quite exposed. Okay. Um, not as much as the UK, but it's close. And then you look at the other countries, you see the, the ones you'd expect, the Netherlands, Germany, ones that we have integrated, you know, we have supply chains running into the UK back out again. Of course, there are some, there are some problems there. Also on the financial uh, stability point of view, from a financial stability point of view, there are potentially some issues that have been identified, but we can already see the EU taking unilateral action on those issues. For example, clear, derivatives clearing houses. Okay. They've said that, OK, we've acknowledged that there is a financial stability risk to the EU here, so in the event of no deal, we would allow um, essentially grant equivalents unilaterally for a year, a year or so. And this is, what the EU, this is something that's underappreciated, is that the EU can take unilateral measures in a lot of these areas. Is it enough? to avoid all of the negative imp impact? Of course not. And it, but, the, but as Henry has articulated, and I think Catherine earlier, the impact is much more acute in the UK, whilst in the EU it's spread quite widely. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, just, just briefly, I think obviously this hits Ireland extremely hard economically, but it's very important to remember the Irish border and what will happen in a no-deal situation um, if the Irish border becomes the external border of the EU with no 
political agreement between the UK and EU27 and will there then be disagreement between Ireland and other members of the EU27 about what to do about that? Um, I've certainly heard some German commentators warning of that. For instance, I don't know what the solution is. I gather the document the Commission is publishing this morning doesn't refer to that, um, but I, I think that that's obviously amidst all the the huge potential chaos and damage of no deal, I think it's terribly important not to only focus on, on well, it's not only economic, obviously health, medicines, transport and so on, but not to forget the Irish okay. peace process. Okay. okay, thank you very much indeed. Stephen Crabb. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the, the panel about the Irish backstop and uh, specifically how the EU sees the backstop. Um, so perhaps I can start by asking Mr Lowe, perhaps open up then to the, the rest of the panel. How real or significant a concession was it on the EU side to move to a whole UK-wide backstop as opposed to Northern Ireland? And when we hear repeatedly from EU ministers and ambassadors that the backstop is not a comfortable outcome long-term for the EU, how, how real are those kind of statements? Because on the other end of the argument, and particularly what's fueling a lot of the opposition on, on my side of British politics towards the backstop, is the idea that it's some kind, somehow some kind of trap that we are being lured into that will remove influence and leverage from the UK position in terms of negotiating a longer-term future trade relationship. How, how, how does the EU actually see the backstop? So, so my opinion on this, and it's an informed opinion, but of course I've, di I've discussed it with lots of people uh, in different member states and, and in the Commission, but it's an opinion nonetheless, is that it, was, it is perceived by them as quite a significant concession in that they did not for a very long period of time want to address whole UK issues as part of the withdrawal agreement. The backstop was initially viewed as an aberration in that, in that it was so, such a significant issue with Northern Ireland that it had to be pulled into the withdrawal agreement and an insurance policy had to be put in place, but they did not want that to be extended to the whole UK. And in the end, it was done so on the UK's request so as to attempt to get the withdrawal agreement over the line. And one of the reasons they're unsure about it is fish hasn't been resolved yet and that's quite a big issue for some countries but also the level playing field provisions while on state aid um, countries are generally happy if you look at the environmental labor rights where it's largely just non-regression with little means of um, enforcement or at least enforcement me mechanisms are envisioned in, on the environmental perspective to be a domestic measure so we'll create our own our own body, there's a worry there that it could allow the UK to gain a competitive advantage in some fields. But the thing, this talk of it being a trap, I, I don't really under, understand because it is still possible under the existing withdrawal agreement and the backstop within it to remove the UK-wide element and revert back to the Northern Ireland-specific element. And this is ultimately why the Commission were OK with this and the EU were OK with allowing the whole UK-wide element because if that were to fall away, the Northern Ireland-specific element remains, which is what they see as the ultimate backstop. So the backstop to the backstop still lives, but it does require two-party consent at this point. The UK would have to choose to, to remove the whole UK element. And that's what we've always known. That there, there, there is a slight sense with commentators on the outside that within Parliament at the moment there's slight Brexit comprehension lag, in that it seems, and I'm not sure if it's just for political reasons, it seems that MPs, not in, on this committee obviously, but elsewhere, uh, are just finding out about things that we've known for a very long time, like the Irish backstop not being unilaterally revocable. And, and there's a part of me that wonders if this is, we're just now going through a process of realisation or if these are actually hard, uh, hard opinions that are not going to shift, which obviously would then lead us towards no deal. So, um, yeah. Take your pick. Uh, I, I would add, it's, it's uncomfortable for the e, from the EU side because it's about goods. It's about um, certainly in Northern Ireland staying in the customs union, the single market for goods, at least in part. And that, of course, goes against their much repeated red line about the indivisibility of the four freedoms. Um, so it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's also uncomfortable because, as we have discussed right at the outset, the dispute resolution provisions are unclear. Um, and, of course, um, from uh, th what the EU have insisted on is no unilateral withdrawal from the um, backstop, which is probably right because we're talking about an insurance policy and you wouldn't want your insurer to unilaterally pull out of your own um, house insurance once um, your house is caught fire. Well, they do, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, I, I don't particularly accept the word trap um, either, but not, not so much in the sense that it doesn't exist, but, but I don't see the backstop in such negative terms because I think it's there for, for ensuring an open border and for ensuring uh, the peace process and Good Friday Agreement continues to work. Having said that, of course, as you know, in the protocol, um, it talks about coming out of the backstop if, the, if and when the future relationship supersedes it in whole or in part. So what the backstop is doing has to be done by the future relationship, and therefore the backstop is always, you know, in a sense, going to have an influence on how that future relationship is negotiated, and it's got to be jointly agreed, and that's the coming out of the backstop, whether in whole or in part it has been superseded. Now, if there was agreement, which clearly there isn't at the moment, if there was agreement, for instance, that the future relationship should be a customs union, then you can see already in the, in the political declaration a clear commitment for building a much deeper customs union, and, and that would probably be preferable for the EU and for the UK if you were going down that route. Um, depending exactly, and Sam can talk more authoritatively than me on this, depending how far you go down that route, might you still need differentiation on standards and, and on the regulation side, but not on the custom side is an open question. So, so I don't think, um, I think it was to some extent a compromise for the, the, the EU, but I mean it was well formulated to, to make it pretty uncomfortable for, for the UK too, but I think it would be in their interests to move move beyond it as long as all the conditions in the backstop are effectively still still covered. Mr. Newman. I think it was, it was um, my, my conversations with the officials and with uh, member states was that it was a substantial compromise to extend the customs union UK wide. Um, I think the, the one country that didn't particularly care about that was Ireland, which just wanted a solution that was workable. Um, but I've certainly heard many EU state diplomats raise very, very strong concerns about fish and level playing field issues. I think the level playing field provisions in the backstop are very positive for the UK. Um, they're not subject to arbitration. They're, they are subject to non-regression, but we can achieve those uh, certain principles in our own way. Um, and I think overall there's been a lack of focus on positives around the backstop from the UK's point of view. I accept the fears of many that we could be in vertical commas trapped there, but I think part of the problem has been the way that the government has approached the backstop by suggesting that they will do everything possible to avoid going into the backstop. That of course creates a negotiation cliff edge over the next um, roughly until June 2020, when we have to take a decision as to whether we seek to extend the backstop. I think if you inverted that rather and said, look, backstop's not ideal. It's not where we want to be long term. However, we are willing to go there and we're willing to, to slice the elephant in chunks and get out of the EU, uh, form a stable relationship in various different areas. We need successor regimes on aviation. We need to work out what we're doing on services already in the backstop. And then while we're there, work out those sort of solutions that would actually allow us to develop a different uh, policy overall. But I think that, that so I, th I would sort of invert the, the way that the government has presented this. I think if you go around saying you would do everything possible to avoid using the backstop, you're setting yourself up for a very weak negotiating position the other side of Article 50. That's a good point. Are, are you surprised by how many, particularly on the left of British politics, have set their face against the withdrawal agreement when it so explicitly puts preserving the gains of the Northern Irish peace process at its heart? Um, I, th I think there's... there's Going back to something that Sam said, I think, I think it was Sam, a minute ago, there, there are basically two ways to leave the European Union, one of which is the deal that's currently on the table, whether it's tweaked, those tweaks could be substantive, but they're going to be tweaks, or without a deal. And everything else is not on the table, it's not possible. So I think when, when you hear people say that they're going to uh, develop all kinds of other options, it's just, it's not, it's, it's not a serious policy. Um, and that, that worries me a great deal. So I think there's a lot of confusion and frankly, dishonesty in the public debate about the options actually available to the UK at this point. Thank you. Unless you've got anything else. No, okay. just, uh, it is, I mean, it, it, there's been so much criticism of this agreement, but it must be said from a, a legal point of view, it is an impressive document. Yes. I mean, it, I know that this might not be music to non-lawyers' ears, but, you know, the fact is that they have drafted best part 600 pages of highly technical stuff um, which hangs together very well the, the, the more difficult question is whether politically it's just, the backstop is sustainable if it ever came into force because of the issues of essentially especially trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland yeah, and true. and I think they, my colleagues he can talk more fluently about that than I can but it is an really impressive 
legal document, something lawyers can be proud of, but um, <laughs> that, that might not commend it to this committee. As well as to the long-term political sustainability of this, it obviously could be potentially subject to challenge from the European side, from potentially from the ECHR side as well. Uh, but also, just there, there are the provisions for the UK to push back on new areas of legislation are possibly arguably stronger than those in the EA agreement, um, and. I've certainly heard Commission officials and Member States officials raise real concerns as to what would happen if we were in the backstop and we started saying no on various different areas. How would that actually be sustainable? Um, so I think those sort of concerns are, are real. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. John Whittingdale. Oh, thank you. Um, can I follow up, Ms. Barnard, <coughs> what you were saying? It, it may be a very beautiful document, but in its present form, it's not going to pass the House of Commons. Now, you suggested, I think, in answer to the chairman a little earlier, that you might see a potential solution around an international agreement <coughs> with some legal force. Could you just expand on particularly the legal force which might be contained in an international agreement and whether that would supersede or complement the withdrawal agreement? How would the two interact? Yeah, so um, what I was talking about um, is what's called in the jargon a decisions of heads of state and government. And that's heads of state acting as independent heads of state, not as acting through the vehicle of the European Council. And that decision of heads of, gate, heads of state and government um, would be probably essentially a very simple treaty and it would be um, <clears throat> binding under international law. Now, the fact it's binding under international law um, means that uh, the UK or the other side could ultimately renege on it and it would be a breach of international law, which is much more difficult to enforce than a breach of EU law. But the UK does not have a tradition, does not have a history of reneging on international commitments, and neither does the EU. So it would be a legally binding um, under international law, not under EU law, but it would be a freestanding text, so therefore you don't tamper with the, the content of the um, withdrawal agreement. Okay. So, in the absence of my colleague Sammy Wilson, can I sort of put on his behalf? Um, he and his party say there must be a change in the text of withdrawal agreement because that ultimately is the only thing which will give legal certainty. Are you saying he's wrong and that this might address that, or actually would? In EU law terms, it still require a change to the text. No, I think it, it would be a way of, of, of trying to square the circle of not actually tampering with the text of the withdrawal agreement, which the EU itself is also reluctant to reopen because they're worried that it would then allow the member states to start reopening issues that at least have temporarily been put into a box, like fisheries and um, like uh, Gibraltar. It would be a freestanding text, and it would be it's the way that the EU has dealt with problems, not on that scale, in the past, over, but particularly over Denmark and uh, Ireland's refusal to uh, accept the Maastricht and uh, Lisbon treaties, respectively, at the time. And it would be a way forward. And it would, you would be able to argue, provide the absolute legal certainty that is demanded by those who are critical of the present withdrawal agreement. So, I, 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 if, I, if you could drop the word absolute, I would say it would provide legal certainty because... Um, it's uh, quite an important word. It's, 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 it's exactly. <laughs> but if, if, if it could be agreed, it would provide legal certainty, yes. OK. Um, can I turn to Andrew Jenkins' questions about the consequences of no deal and what might then immediately happen. So if we move to the 30th of March, and Britain is now a third country without a formal comprehensive agreement. A lot of the sort of suggestions of the difficulties that might follow are based on the fact that suddenly lorries which passed through Calais in a minute on the 29th of March are going to take 10 or 15 minutes on the 30th. To what extent is that a matter of choice for the EU? Or are they required to impose checks on third countries as a matter of EU law? 
So they are required to impose checks on third countries as a matter of EU law and also under international commitments. But, but of course, it is possible for emergency provisions to be brought into force so as to alleviate some of the pressures, at least in the immediate aftermath. And we're starting to see what the EU is prepared to do on that front because they're publishing their no deal preparation notices where they've said where in different areas they might do this. But, but say on sanitary and phytosanitary issues, we know from, we haven't seen the specific text yet, but we know from the briefing <coughs> notes that were sent from the Commission to the Council and European Parliament, there's no intention to do very much here. So what does this mean in practice? It means that all products of animal origin exiting the UK and entering the EU will need to enter via a veterinary border inspection post where they will be subject to 100% uh, document and identity checks and then about 50% at the upper rate for physical inspections for, for say milk for human consumption and the problem the UK has there is that Calais and the Eurotunnel aren't veterinary border inspection posts under EU law so with that it's, there's some suggestion in the EU's no deal planning notices that they could maybe fast track some, they could authorise some other areas for a, a brief period of time so as to facilitate the continued movement of trade but what you still will get is the friction and then also in the EU's notice that it does make the point that the UK can't be accepted as a third country licensed to sell products of animal origin to the EU until after March the 29th but that could be fast tracked so my point being here using that specific example is that there are things that the EU can do and will do to alleviate some of the pressures but will there be more friction than now the answer is absolutely yes I think a lot of people would accept there may be a, a, more friction than there is now, but to what extent does emergency provisions essentially give <coughs> the EU the ability to set the rules as they would choose? Are there, are there any absolute requirements under the law which they would feel, even though it would cause considerable disruption on both sides? Of the channel that they have to impose, or do these emergency provisions essentially give them powers to implement or not implement what they like? So, so the line they're using is that they're using emergency powers to uh, alleviate issues that they feel could be systemic to the EU, so of, 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 of extreme detriment, but they're not going to act in areas where businesses could have taken contingency measures and, and, if, and maybe didn't choose to. And these will only ever be short term, they've put a time limit on them, but it is possible for them to do these things and we have an increasingly clear idea of where they will do this. So the example I used earlier was on um, clearing houses and, uh, and uh, an equivalence ruling to allow... But if it to required, them. say, the installation of technology at the ports or maybe the establishment of a veterinary mm -hmm. check centre, the EU could say, well, until those things are in place, we will exercise emergency powers and allow essentially trade to continue. They, they could do, but we know, for example, on the veterinary issue, they're not going to because they, they, they've, they've now said that. Um, in, in, and that could only ever, as I said, be, be short term. But as an emergency, I mean, so say people sometimes point to WTO TO rules as, as preventing emergency provisions. Of course they don't. We could say on both the UK and the EU side, this is an emergency and we need six months to bring in place, mm. to create the infrastructure, the processes in which to enforce our border with the UK on terms similar to what we do with the rest of the world. That's fine. But this only is going to happen to a degree because of EU choices in different areas and it can only ever last for a short period of time because after a while they will be obliged to treat the UK as they do any other third country with which they do not have a preferential arrangement. Okay. Mm, I mean, the message I've certainly picked up in the EU is that, as, as we see with, the, we know this document is coming out this morning um, from the Commission on its no deal preparation, but they're ready to take unilateral measures. They expect there to be some chaos, um, is the phrase I've heard, and they expect there to be quite a big gap between the situation as it is now and the situation it would be between EU and UK in, in the event of no deal. Um, as far as I'm aware, some of the measures that are going to be proposed this morning cover things like aviation, um, they cover road transport, where certainly, you know, I don't think the EU is trying to be as difficult as possible. It seems that they will let hauliers for a limited period of time, you know, still have permission to take lorries across. They're trying to put 
time limits on, on customs checks. Um, but on the other hand, there's nothing there, um, according to reports, yet on medications, on data, on fisheries. Um, so this probably isn't the last word on it, I would think, for the next three months anyway. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, Seema Malhotra. Thank you, Chair. I want to turn to the political declaration and to um, take your views on a, a couple of issues in relation to that. You have, I think, already intimated that uh, the political declaration could be, you could see that being amended and it doesn't have, as le it doesn't have legal force, so there's less challenge in amending it if it can be changed later. In our most recent report on the withdrawal agreement and political declaration, we noted that the Secretary of State told us that the political declaration keeps options for the future relationship open and there would therefore be a range of possible options that could be considered as the basis of future negotiations um, if Parliament was to approve the deal. Can I ask your view on the political declaration as it stands? Does it to you suggest a direction of travel that you could identify um, and or would you say that it really does sort of lay out a canvas and leave all options on the table? Should I, start with should, I, should I start? I, I would say, um, first of all, by definition, because it's political declaration, therefore totally non-legally binding on either side, and so, of course, it can be torn up tomorrow. Um, and so, uh, therefore, whatever it says um, will not be legally binding in the future. Um, secondly, if you take it as a, a, a global document, it looks more like Canada than it does Norway plus. Um, and certainly if you read only the first page, um, and only get to paragraph four, it says very clearly that there's going to be an independent trade policy and the ending of free movement. An independent trade policy would suggest that we would be leaving the customs union. Um, however, it's in internally contradictory because um, at uh, um, paragraph um, 23, it talks about a single customs territory. Which looks, which of course is the language in the protocol, and it looks like the UK will be staying in a customs union. But if you look at other matters, because we've spent a lot of time talking about goods, of course, services is far more um, important uh, for our economy, although that's of course not to deny the importance of manufacturing, but um, there is really quite little on services. Um, uh, Sam is the expert in that field, but it's quite striking just how little there is on services. And as far as mobility is concerned, all we know is that there is going to be a future mobility framework, but this seems to fall very, very far short of free movement as we know it. We're told it's come to an end. So again, it looks much more like what's in the Canadian um, CETA than it does um, anything else that we are familiar with under EU law. Thank you. Sam, can I ask you to follow up on that point about services? Well, well, well it's fundamentally... Actually, I think the government has been slightly clearer on what it wants to achieve from services, with the caveat that, of course, this political declaration doesn't bind anyone to, to actually follow this through. But in saying, and, and this goes back to the white paper, in acknowledging that freedom of movement is something the UK no longer wants, they have acknowledged that services access will be lesser, less than it is now and and that's quite an interesting I, I found that bit of check as it was underexplored because everyone was focusing on the on the facilitated customs arrangement but actually this acknowledgement that because we don't have freedom of movement, don't want freedom of movement we're not going to get the same access on services was made that that bit of the paper far more interesting because it's actually something the eu could substantially negotiate against because it, it accepts trade-offs and the political declaration doesn't add much more clarity on this but my interpretation of what the uk is saying is that we accept that it will become much more difficult for services companies, in, uh, services industries based in the UK to export directly to the European Union. We know from the EU side that they're willing to make it much easier to establish entities there. They're willing to go further on the temporary movement of people to supply services, but that's in the UK's gift. What sort of mobility, labour mobility regime do we want? 
and that's a constraint there. So largely the political declaration as it is laid out is suggesting that at least on services we are going to have not much different from what you would get under, say, Canada. And actually, if you look at the provisions on services within Canada, it's not much different from what you get at the WTO GATS level. So we're looking at going from quite a high level of integration, and I know it's popular in the UK to say that the single market for services doesn't exist, but that's just not true. And we're going from quite a high level of integration, specifically in some highly regulated areas, including financial services, legal services, to going as far away as possible. To a degree, and of course that will have an impact. But as to whether the political declaration binds us to this outcome, no. It presents the government's intended approach. It's self-contradictory. If you were to pursue this approach, at least that's how it's outlined in, outlined in the first uh, few paragraphs, you wouldn't be able to obviate the need for a backstop. Mm. So, so it's self-contradictory in that, in that sense. But yes, yeah, so that's the direction of travel as it stands. But I would argue that the political declaration itself does still leave open or possibilities from Norway plus plus whatever, whatever that looks like to Canada with the caveat I made earlier that Canada can only apply to Great Britain. Would that suggest that... It, sorry. Just, I agree with most of what's been said. I think in answer to your, your initial question, I think there are, there are basically two main directions of travel and one, one sounds like a, a Canada or possibly a Canada plus but, but as Sam has just said there's not that much plus there on services so you know we're getting used to seeing triple pluses on Canada but the defence, the security, criminal cooperation is there but it's not clear there's much of a plus on services and it's not clear there ever has been if you were to go down um, that track you would certainly have to then keep Northern Ireland in a, in a separate Backstop, but I, I think as well there is quite a strong nod because of the single customs territory point towards uh, Turkey or even a Turkey plus with perhaps more regulatory alignment than and obviously Turkey has to meet EU regulations to, to export to the EU. So I, I think the, there's quite a strong nod in that direction. I do think it, it is extraordinary, as, as my fellow panellists have said, that, that so much of the Brexit discussion has has essentially almost ignored services, you know, when they're such a big part of our economy. Um, the political declaration talks about equivalence in financial services, you know, which, as we know, is much less than we have now. Um, but it, your, so that's the direction of travel, but as, as Sam says, Norway could be in there too. If I could ask you this then, uh, what would your understanding be then of the implications for us having access to, say, the EU free trade agreements that currently exist, would there be an interpretation of this that would, in the future, give access to those, or are we, are we now sort of excluding ourselves from them? That obviously there's 40 plus trade agreements that cover around 70 countries outside the EU. Uh, legally speaking, from March, the end of March next year, we're no longer party to any of these trade agreements. The transition uh, provisions outline a, pr a process by which the EU will notify third countries that they can to continue to treat the EU as a member state for the purpose of these agreements for the duration of the transition. But there's no guarantee. But, but that requires third country consent. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that most will go along with it. They might ask for concessions from the UK vis-a-vis -vis something else or the future replaced agreement to get it, but most, I think, will go along with that. But there's no mechanism at all by which the UK automatically remains party to all of these agreements. They all need to be replaced. And of course, replacing them could be difficult. Some countries might say, OK, we're happy to use the existing agreement as the template and just cross out and change some words. But others will ask for concessions. And also, as we've seen, so, so we recently had the declaration uh, that the Swiss are happy to replicate um, the existing arrangement no matter what, so even in, if we had no deal last year. But it's interesting to note that from my intelligence on this, they've only uh, uh, agreed to replicate three of the bilaterals because the others are dependent on, so that would be the initial free trade agreement, it being extended to agriculture and some mutual recognition of conformity assessment. Because the rest, they're waiting to know what the future relationship with the EU looks like. And that will be the same for all of these countries. Can I ask you this final question then, and perhaps Henry can come in on, on these. How long do you think it's going to take to negotiate the future framework? It's very broad uh, in terms of the areas it needs to cover. So, uh, just to sort of go back to the first question and come to that in just a second. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the, the most interesting thing about the political declaration is it doesn't point to a Czechoslovak relationship. 
um, and that's been absent from a lot of the responses that we've seen, uh, particularly from the, the Conservative side, who are very opposed to a checkered star relationship. I don't think it it's, could be, you could reach a facilitated customs arrangement, but there's nothing in the text that directly points to that. Um, I think it puts, points to a default of Canada, but with a broad spectrum of op options where really everything is possible if you can resolve the backstop. Very big and conditional, but nonetheless, it, it leaves it pretty wide open. Um, I think in terms of the how long would it take to replace a, a, to, a, to develop a successor regime? Depends what you want that successor regime to look like. But I think the uh, even to, to come up with a Norway Plus model, which is presented by some of its proponents as an off-the-shelf option, would be far from simple. Um, so I think there's it, it, it'll, it'll depend what sort of relationship you want um, to, to answer that question. A lot of this is knowing what you want, because if we actually look back in the past two months, we managed to negotiate a customs union in about two weeks. Right, so, 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 so you can negotiate things quickly if you have a shared objective. The problem the UK has is that we don't know what we want in the future relationship and it's becoming increasingly uh, clear that the argument being used by the government is we will get you out and then it's up for, to someone else or us again maybe to decide what the future relationship looks like. And that requires a domestic discussion and actually some decisions to be made. And that's going to take one. This also exists on the EU side. We have the European Parliament elections coming up. We then have the Commission uh, reshuffle. That's a lot of time that's just not going to be used for anything substantive on the negotiation front. It might be used usefully domestically in terms of coming to a decision. So could you do it in two years? Theoretically, yes. I think pointing to, say, other examples of trade negotiations... Realistically, do you think, based on the experience that we've had so I don't far, think... It, no, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, would I, you think it would be one year or two years extension? Or I, I think we'd use the whole lot. Yeah, it takes an average 42 months to negotiate a trade agreement. It's also worth bearing in mind that the future agreement, of course, will not be done under Article 50, but will be done under Article 207 or 217, more likely probably 217, um, and that will require ratification of uh, not just the EU, but also all the member states, including um, the regional parliaments in Belgium, which, of course, um, had issues with the CETA, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind, of course, that never before has a trade agreement been negotiated which lowers integration rather than improves integration so that will also um, prove difficult and it also present um, communication and presentational challenges to both sides because it's going to be harder to say look we've got a win on this because the tariffs have been reduced from 10% to 5% because of course the starting the baseline at the moment is 0% okay thank you very much just to clarify one point mr low the the 40 or so trade deals you <coughs> referred to what happens under the withdrawal agreement. If we leave with no deal, they all fall? They Do all you think there would be an appetite on the part of those countries to roll them over? So, so, so I, 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 I was always a bit critical of the term rollover. And I, <coughs> I don't think they can be rolled over. We'll, so they will cease to apply. Our agreement, as, as, as it stands, as a member of the EU, will cease to apply from day one if there is no deal. Will those countries want to replicate... The arrangements. I think lots will. I think if, if we're being honest, it's still in their interest to have preferential access to the UK market and vice versa. However, they might not want it on exactly the same terms right. as now because the UK is a smaller market and they potentially and have in some areas made concessions to the EU that they would not want to make to the UK. So it would be a negotiation? All and, of these are negotiations. trade negotiations yes. take time. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, Jonathan Janonkley. To move on to the possibility of a second referendum. Um, so, parking for one moment the question, the, the, um, what the question would be, and also the EU's attitude towards this, if we can just look at it domestically to start with. Um, how could a second referendum be triggered in legislative terms, perhaps? Professor Bernard? Yeah, so thank you. Um, it will require um, legislation, as did the first <coughs> referendum. That legislation, it could be an amendment to an existing bill going through Parliament. Mm. Uh, it, the question is, of course, relevant because uh, there will be a delay in the legislative process because the Electoral Commission needs to have a look at the terms of the question and, and road test the question. And, of course, if it's a three-pronged question, it will require more work than a two-pronged question. Um, and there's also issues about whether you just replicate the franchise that right. was the case 
before. The franchise before was the same franchise as for a general election, which produces the oddity that um, UK nationals who've lived abroad for more than 15 years and uh, couldn't, couldn't vote, nor could um, Polish uh, Lithuanian citizens living in the, in the UK. Um, whereas Commonwealth citizens who might have only been here a very short period of time could have voted. And so there is an argument, on, particularly on the Remain side, that the franchise needs to be looked at. The Leave side would say, were they even to count in the second referendum? Say, so got to keep the franchise the same. Well, is there a legal argument to say that the franchise should be kept the same because you know, it was what it was last time, so it should be the same this time? Um, or, or would they simply be different pieces of legislation providing for different referenda. <coughs> uh, I mean, there's also 16-year-olds, for instance. Exactly. Where should Commonwealth be able to vote uh, or should European citizens be able to vote? So you see, if the, there's a huge pressure of time, it's easier to keep the franchise as it was for 2016 than uh, in, come up with a new um, franchise. Of course, there's nothing to stop uh, a franchise being changed, but all of these are big questions which will require debate. and. It's going to take six months, probably, at a minimum, to have the referendum. If you're arguing about that, that will extend the period. Yeah, the Constitution Unit estimated the minimum period as 22, 22 weeks. weeks. Would, would the panel agree with that yeah. period? Yeah. <coughs> I'd also say that I think if the executive introduces legislation on this, it may end up looking very different once it's gone through Parliament. You could introduce legislation requiring a particular franchise and a particular question. And Parliament could amend that to take options off or extend the franchise in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, what would uh, what would need to be included in the question? Do you think, Kirsty Hughes? I think um, I think as we've said earlier in, in today's session, I think in the end there are you know we are facing two two simple outcomes at one level: do we leave the EU or do we not leave the EU? So I think there should certainly therefore be a not leave the EU I, a remain option. The question of what you put as the leave the EU option, I think, is, is much more difficult, and it depends where we are at the time the Parliament agreed to have a referendum, because, again, we've mostly, I think, agreed that any, any deal um, in the next few months would, would require something that looks very like the current withdrawal agreement to be part of that deal. But if, if the deal is rejected, say, in the week of the 14th of January, if it doesn't come back to Parliament, um, who, you know, if you were going to put that deal on, on the ballot paper, who's actually going to campaign for that? You know, which politicians will say that they're ready to campaign for that? But if you put, you know, would it be responsible for Parliament to put no deal on the ballot paper? Would it be responsible to put Canada on the ballot paper without a Northern Ireland backstop, in which case surely that actually does sound like May's deal. So, so I think it's politically contingent, but where we are now, I think, um, Remain versus the current deal on offer um, would, would be the sensible choice. I think the question was answered yeah. in uh, 2016 on whether we're leaving the European Union or not, but that's a political, uh, political point. Uh, I think the the fundamental difficulty which was just, just alluded to is that if you create a second referendum, you're going to end up with campaigns chasing different unicorns again. And you're going to have a Remain campaign essentially saying that we're going to spend all the money that we would have spent on no deal on all kinds of fancy tax cuts and so on. You're going to have a no deal campaign making all kinds of promises about uh, what would be, how the money of the so-called Brexit bill would be spent on domestic objectives and so on. And you'd have, you saw a Labour uh, front bencher suggesting that if there was a second referendum, uh, they would campaign for the Labour Brexit deal, which doesn't exist. So I think... I think it's profoundly problematic in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of directions. Mr. Lowe? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. I don't know what the question would say. That's that's really your decision. I think so, in Parliament. <laughs> so, in ter in ter <laughs> so, so pe people have been also commenting on the role of the electoral commission here and the extent to which they may have a say on whether it should be a binary question or three questions or. Could someone explain what the role of the Electoral Commission would be in this context? All, all I would add yeah. is, is that um, the, uh, it, 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 it is a requirement under the legislation that, 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 we, that the Electoral Commission um, look at the questions. And then, of course, there's a further issue. If you go for a three-pronged question, do you ask the three questions at the same time, or do you have various permutations? Do you vote 
um, one week on one question uh, on one permutation and then a second week on the second that's not the we haven't well, we haven't got much experience of referenda but we haven't gone down that route so far the real I think the practical concern is if you have a three-pronged question that says leave leave on the Theresa May's deal or remain is that you end up with 30 30 30 um, or some very narrow permutation thereof and it doesn't actually take us any further any further forward. And, and in terms of the decision made by the Electoral Commission, is that challengeable? Can you judicially review the decision of the Electoral Commission? Um, I think the answer to that must be yes, but I, I would like to check. Okay. And, and in terms of the um, European Union, how might the European Union respond to a second referendum request, does the panel think? I mean, the tw if it was 22 weeks, we would be heading beyond the European elections, for instance. So, I mean, I, th I think, as I said earlier, I think they probably would extend Article 50, um, fairly reluctantly, given the European Parliament <coughs> question. But that can't be guaranteed because it's at unanimity. Um, you know, some people say that the, the European Commission doesn't really want us back, or at least some significant people in it, but it doesn't have a vote. Others mention France. Um, I don't know what the rest of the panel pick up, but on the whole I pick up um, that the EU think they would probably they would probably get there, but not without quite a bit of horse trading first. And not, not only, you know, and that horse trading could then of course impact on the politics here, because if there's a, a, a decision to have a second referendum, you actually, you actually want some support from the EU. It's not going to be great, at least on the Remainer side, <laughs> Um, if the EU is sounding very lukewarm or making lots of demands about, you know, wanting some money, more money or more fish or what, you know, less fish, whatever the argument do, do is. Do you think that if there, was, if, they, if there wasn't a remain option on, on the ballot, um, that that would impact their view? Um, I I'm, I'm think... Well, I think they'd be surprised, and I would be surprised, but I, th I wonder what their view would be to more to having a no-deal option on the ballot paper and, yeah. and um, whether they would be prepared to extend in that case. I, I think they would, and this is, again, I think you can't guarantee it, I think they would probably be okay with extending to allow for a referendum if it was a referendum that led to a certain outcome. So it couldn't be a referendum that would then be followed by more negotiations. So it would, if it had the option of remain, okay, that's a certain outcome. If it had no deal on there, okay, that's a certain outcome. And if it had uh, uh, Mrs May withdrawal agreement on there, okay, that's a certain outcome. So they would extend up to the date of the results coming in, and then the next day that is what would happen. They would still be slightly wary about it because, of course, the preparations for no deal <coughs> and is very different from the preparations for a managed withdrawal or, or, or remain. But I think they would allow that. But they, I, I don't think there's any circumstance under this, and I'm not sure where there could be from a, referendum, from a referendum perspective, but whereby they would extend in the knowledge that they'd then have to extend again because you'd then have to get into loads of discussions. They, they really just want an answer at this point. It's worth saying, I think I'm correct in this, that if we, if we voted then to remain and therefore revoke Article 50, we would be remaining on pre-2016 uh, renegotiation terms. So Cameron's uh, renegotiation would essentially fall away. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Question, yeah. uh, right, Pat McFadden. Um, I fear I'm going to continue um, Jonathan Ginogli's uh, uh, idea of asking you perhaps more political questions than, than factual ones, but I just want to return to this issue of no deal or extending Article 50. We've got uh, announcements today in the newspapers that the armed forces are being prepared. I expect more of this in coming days with perhaps implications for food supplies, medical supply, jobs, industry, all this kind of thing. If we get to a point where the Prime Minister's uh, negotiated deal is not approved by Parliament in January, how realistic do you think it is that any UK government would march forward to that proposition rather than seeking to extend Article 50. Can I start with you, Ms. Hughes? Sorry, could you just clarify the do last you, bit? If, if, if the deal is voted down by Parliament, yes. do you think any UK government will blithely march towards no deal, or will, is it your judgment that the more likely outcome then is some sort of extension to Article 50? 
I think I, I don't find it credible. So, um, it, I mean, UK politics is in an extraordinary state, but I don't find it credible that a UK government would go forward to no deal. Um, and I mean, the problem at the moment in terms of where Brexit goes is there doesn't seem to be a majority for anything in Parliament. There, there seems, I would think, to be a majority against going ahead with a no deal. Um, I think the problem with extending Article 50, I mean, there might be a, a majority in Parliament even today for extending, well, maybe not as of today, but anyway, maybe after a rejection of, of, of a deal, for extending Article 50. But as we said earlier, I don't think the EU is going to accept a request to extend Article 50 if it's not for something specific, if it's just for the fact that mm. Parliament has just rejected May's deal, there isn't an expectation that that deal is going to come back again, the EU will be wanting to know, as it wants to know today and now, what the UK government and the UK parliament want. So do they want an election? Do they want another vote? Do they want uh, a change in the political declaration to point it more in one direction than another? Um, what do they want? And is it, is it something that the government wants that can also, whoever the government is, um, that can be got through? Parliament, and, and when I say whoever the government is, because depending where this goes in the next few months, we've just been talking about a, a second referendum, depending on if it had remained on the, on the ballot paper, it is again that credible that the current government would drive such a referendum through. Might, might you have, a, you know, there's been some discussion of national unity governments or temporary caretaker governments. I mean, there are a lot of process scenarios of where this may go, but there's only, there's only two choices, substantively, Brexit or no Brexit. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, legally, we're not ready yet. We've got the EU Withdrawal um, Act 2018, which provides the framework for us leaving, which obviously you know far better than, than I, but um, there's about 700 pieces of secondary legislation that needs to be adopted under the delegated powers in that act. The Institute for Government is saying that uh, only a third of them have been introduced so far. And so the attempt to try and smooth this process of no deal um, is far, far, far short. And if you look at um, the National Audit Office and their reports on the key government departments, they've looked particularly at DEFRA, if you look at the introduction of computer systems, IT systems, they are, they are at red in some of the key departments. So there is, in terms of you're trying to go for an orderly no-deal Brexit, we're a long way short at the moment, but it may be that's where the, um, all the extra money is going to be applied to try and get things through, but there is a capacity issue. I'll come to you in just a second, I just want to, when you say legally we're not ready yet, can you spell, not ready for what? So sort of c continuity for recognition of um, goods coming in from abroad um, because uh, the, all of the, uh, uh, for um, managing the, uh, what's going to happen with financial services, for example, all of that, that's what the EU Withdrawal Act is about, is to empower Parliament to adopt all of this secondary legislation to make sure that there is a smooth process. And what does that imply for your judgment about the realism of the deal or no deal position that the Prime Minister has taken, will that still look realistic at the end of January if Parliament has voted down the deal? I think it, it would say that it depends on how far the Prime Minister is really prepared to go to uh, take such a serious decision um, with very difficult legal, uh, legal consequences that will follow and whether um, and the deep uncertainty that will follow as a result from that. But it may be she decides that this is the only way forward politically to arm um, twist the EU into um, getting what she wants out of them. Um, but uh, we are not legally ready. Uh, on, on, on the political point, I would say it's not in the government's interest or the EU's interest to countenance the extension of Article 50 at this point because it's the threat of no deal that is deemed to be the only thing that could focus minds in Parliament and allow the withdrawal agreement, which has been agreed by the EU and the UK. So the EU like this withdrawal agreement and they want to see it pass. So they will not countenance, I don't think, the extension of Article 50 until very, very late in the day, because until then it can be used as a means of browbeating Parliament into 
accepting what's on the table. And, sure, the EU's and that's clearly how it is being. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Used. And it's, you know, we're going to have a grid of, I expect, a grid of announcements over Christmas on this. But my question really is, would EUK government do this? Because in a sense, every time they make an announcement saying there's this terrible consequence of it here or this terrible consequence of it there, it does beg a sort of boomerang question. Well, are you really going to say there's no alternative but this? Well, it's the default option. You, you, so, 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 so if you do nothing else, this is what happens. So, so the answer is, could it, if, if the answer is, could a UK government do this? Yes. Would it? Would it? And then that goes, gets, that gets intensely political. As it, to, is, it is political. Yes. It depends on Parliament, doesn't it? Because if, if Parliament cannot get a majority for something, as Sam says, it's the default option. So there has to be a majority for something. And so Parliament legislated after the Miller case to trigger Article 50, and par therefore Parliament set this time, um, time horizon that the government is, is, is coming, heading towards. I find it, I, mean, that it's, I think the, the value judgment you place on the government's blitheness, uh, I call into question. I don't think the government is being blithe about this, but I think the default position is that we will leave on March the 29th, and therefore the government is obligated to take preparations very seriously. Uh, there's a very easy solution to this, which is that Parliament chooses to vote for the deal. Uh, in which case, this, we don't need to worry about no deal preparation. That's the, that's the Prime Minister's position. Which What's the correct position? There's, there's three choices. Which deal, you, no deal, remain. Yeah, that, that's the Prime Minister's position, which you've set out admirably. My, my question is really one of, um, is if we're in a scenario, I understand that it's the default position, I understand it could happen, but my question to you, and it is a political question, I appreciate that, uh, would any UK Prime Minister, I'm not particularly picking on this one, would any UK Prime Minister say, right, now that you're not, the Parliament's not voted for the deal, that's what's going to happen now, and that's what we're going to do? Do you think that's what she'll do? I think it's quite possible, yes. I, think, I don't think it's, you could possibly say that any UK Prime Minister would, would be willing to do that. I think, I think the Prime Minister, rightly or wrongly, takes very seriously uh, the fact that the, the country voted uh, to leave the European Union and wants to see that delivered. I mean, I extraordinary and incredible that any Prime Minister would allow that sort of damage to be done to this country. So that's why I'm asking the question. Okay. Okay. Right, Joanna Cherry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask about Norway Plus, as it's now referred to, and um, I'd like to start with you, Kirsty. You've said that um, you think the, the European Union is open to a Norway Plus outcome. Um, but they'd want to make sure that the UK couldn't be disruptive in any new structures, that there were strong level playing field conditions, and that there were deals around agriculture and fisheries, and that this would take time to negotiate. Can you elaborate upon that? Mm. I mean, I think, I think yes, the, the EU is open to Norway Plus. I think certainly um, a number of them find it fairly surprising that, that that might be considered by the UK, uh, just as they find the fact that, that even the UK has agreed a customs union in the backstop is surprising because for countries like France and Germany at least it's inconceivable that they would put themselves into that sort of uh, rule taker position. So, so I think they're also very aware that there are different political drives behind those who suggested whether Norway for now or Norway plus. Um, you know, uh, Norway for now seems to have morphed into Norway plus, but, you know, the EU do listen to the British debates very carefully. Um, and the idea that somehow Norway might be used as a way to circumvent the backstop, so you go into it and then later you say, OK, now we can have a fantastical customs arrangement that isn't a customs union but still allows no rules of origin, or now we can put in 12 months' notice um, to leave the EEA again, sh should you be allowed into the EEA. Um, they're aware of all that, that's quite problematic, and given that to exit the backstop, backstop as we were discussing earlier, you have to have a, a joint agreement, and you obviously have to have a joint agreement to have a future relationship, I mean, it's quite possible that they might try and put conditions in that ensured that it, if there was a, a, a Norway plus, that if after 12 months the UK decided to pull out, that there might be some possibility of some backstop conditions kicking back in. I think, you know, some people talk about Norway or Norway plus, and it, it have to be plus the customs union because you don't get frictionless trade and you don't solve the Irish border otherwise, as the least worst option. 
I disagree with that. I think it may be the least worst option economically, but it's clearly not the least worst option democratically. And I think um, even if it would be the least worst option economically, it would still be problematic. You, you don't have to look very long at the extent of the EU's structures to, to make laws and policies you know, through the Commission, through the Parliament, through the Council of Ministers, with the whole system of voting and the UK being at the table and so on and so forth, to think that that matters. And I myself worked in the Commission for two years. You know, How countries influence getting to laws and outcomes that are in their interest depends on being at the table. I mean, in my two years at the Commission, I really can't remember hearing Norway's views being brought up by somebody in, in any meeting that I was at. Um, I did just bring one quote from a study Norway did itself in 2012 of 20 years of being in the European economic area. Um, the report's author um, said that it, it had created a great democratic deficit and also said there are few areas of Norwegian democracy today where so many know so little about so much, as is the case with Norwegian European policy. Um, just a couple more comments. I mean, people also seem to often suggest it's very straightforward to join EFTA and then to join the European Economic Area. Obviously, first of all, you've got to get agreement of the EFTA countries. If you want to be in a customs union, you've got to get those countries to agree to derogate from Article 56.3 of, of the EFTA Convention on not trying to sign up to... EFTA trade policies, um, no country at the moment obviously is both in the EEA and in a customs union uh, with the EU, so that would be a bigger democratic deficit than this Norwegian uh, study found for Norway, but also what I pick up in the EU, and I suspect my fellow panellists may have heard the same, is, is that the EEA and also the Swiss arrangements were made for smaller countries and perhaps less troublesome countries and that if you actually gave the UK the exact same, you know, even if it was maybe a parallel structure, so not to overshadow the smaller countries in the EEA, if you gave the UK the exact same um, abilities to, to, in certain ex extreme circumstances, veto things and so on, they'd be much more likely to use it than, than Norway have. So I think um, it would take time to negotiate. I think certainly issues like fisheries would, would come back up, other level playing field conditions. Um, but I think, I think you could get there. I find it very hard to imagine it would be politically sustainable in the UK. And I think you know, as soon as, and we may see this yet in an extended transition period, as soon as the EU takes decisions in some areas that are sensitive here or not in our interests, that's going to be highly neuralgic, and instead of people like me saying, no, no, that scare story on a tabloid is a, is a scare story, it will, be, it will be true. So I think people have um, morphed to this or moved to this as a compromise option. It's, I'm not sure it's a good compromise. It's not. It's one that certainly polls suggest Remainers prefer to leave us, so it's not clear it's really a compromise. Um, and, and if you were going to vote for that, why would you not vote to stay in the European Union? Just, just picking up on the point about fisheries there, some people have suggested that the Norway Plus option is um, attractive because we could leave the common fisheries policy and also the common agricultural policy. But of course, as you've commented in one of your articles, all EEA members require to agree to the UK mm -hmm. uh, joining the European Economic Area. And how likely is it that fisheries would come into that sort of debate. How likely is it that there would be a trade-off between access to UK waters and the UK's access to, uh, the, to the market? I, th I think it's very likely. I think this is a phrase you know, I first picked up in Brussels at least a year and a half ago around no access to markets without access to waters. We obviously, and I think coming back to what's sort of a compromise in the withdrawal agreement, I mean, you know, there's a, there are a couple of rather important sentences there about aiming to agree access and quotas before, uh, I, th I think it's by mid-2020 mid and before the end of the first transition period. We, we also see in terms of the backstop, of course, in, in Article 6.2 of the protocol that Northern Ireland is intended to be in some sense within the customs union for fisheries, but, but the rest of the UK outside, which... Uh, 
for instance, for the West Coast Scot Scottish fishermen, is going to be very problematic if you've got queues at borders and, and tariffs. Um, so, so the subsectors within the fishing sector, I think we have to take account of as well. So, no, I think that the fact that Norway has an EEA agreement does not mean that's automatically available and on the same terms, including on fisheries, as Norway has it, and it needs all 27 EU members of the EEA as well as the three EFTA members to agree. So, so it, it's a huge political process. I think in terms of process, we also have to be far, far more articulate in the UK debate about how you get there. So the first process is withdrawal, and if you go via a withdrawal agreement, it comes with a backstop. That backstop still exists. Then, of course, you could get to a Norway-type arrangement. And I think this is where maybe the British debate has been too literal. We talk about Canada and Norway. The EU has always used those as examples of the type of a balance of access and obligations. It wouldn't literally look like Canada, and it might not literally look like Norway. There is still the possibility that you could enter via EFTA agreement and into the EEA. But actually, what the EU would prefer... And it's probably more in the UK's interest if you were to go that route, and the EA countries would prefer, is a bespoke arrangement that's built on similar terms to the EA agreement. Because if we were to enter into such an agreement with the purpose of obviating the need to ever use the Northern Irish backstop, so a whole UK approach that means that you do not need separate provisions from Northern Ireland, it would also have to not only just cover fish in agriculture, you would need to have something, you probably need to be in a customs union, but even deeper than a customs union, you probably need to be in within the union customs code, which is what Northern Ireland is under the backstop. And you'd also need provisions on VAT and excise. You go, you're going quite a long way further than the existing EEA agreement. It's not to say that we couldn't then share some of the same infrastructure or as, as the EEA EFTA country, so the EFTA court, EFTA surveillance mechanism, maybe that could be adapted. So, so, so that is certainly possible. But then on the EU defensive side, they are all right, there are already concerns within the EU about Norwegian, not non-implementation, but delayed implementation, and with the UK they would want to address that, and then also on level playing field there would be an issue, and also this, the talk about we could trigger Article 112 and do something on freedom of movement, uh, we've been talking, we, we can't pretend the EU hasn't noticed this, <laughs> you know, and, and wouldn't put in something in a bespoke arrangement to prevent that from happening. So Norway plus 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 is certainly, or if you want to call it that or whatever, or an e DPU UK association agreement, is certainly possible as an outcome, but we should be clear about how we get there and some of the difficulties along the way. Just, just on process, earlier, Sam, you made a comment about um, the Labour front bench being a bit unrealistic about what could be achieved by an extension of Article 50. Could you elaborate I upon think that? Was Henry. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Oh, elaborate in what terms, sorry? You made a comment about the Labour front bench being a bit unrealistic about what could be achieved by the extension of Article 50. Now, I understood you to mean by that that you can't just extend Article 50 to negotiate some arrangement which the Labour front bench are unclear as to what it is they want to negotiate, but they seem to think they could get something better. What's your view on that? Uh, yes, I think you can, you can accept, we've set out the terms in which you can extend Article 50 with EU agreement, but it would probably be a referendum or a general election. Mm. Uh, I don't think you can re extend it to change aspects of the withdrawal agreement, um, and suggesting that is problematic. I think, to, to pick up Sam's point, if you want to go for a Norway Plus option, my understanding is the proponents of that are saying accept the withdrawal agreement and then have either in the political declaration or elsewhere a commitment to head towards a uh, permanent customs union and then negotiate a protocol to the EA agreement and potentially protocol to the EFTA agreement, this gets very messy. What happens then when you're in the transition and you're trying to turn those things from a protocol into an actual treaty, you come up against all kinds of negotiating cliff edges where the price is going to be fish, level playing field, Gibraltar, uh, more tight regulations on our services, diversions. And I think that the, the Commission would be happy to look at it, as I understand it, a closer relationship, but it's not going to be simply Norway's closer relationship. Um, and then I think there, I've also heard from key member states a concern that they simply don't believe that that relationship would be sustainable in the long term for the UK. That either we would push back against uh, elements of the agreement, perhaps on migration, perhaps uh, on other areas of rule taking, and therefore either create a huge problem within the agreement, blow up the agreement, or we'd fall out of it and have to spend the whole time renegotiating a successor regime. So I think they are very sceptical of that, that, that this would be a realistic option for the UK in anything other than uh, the short term. And I think as a short term option, it doesn't work. Okay. Just, a, just very, very quickly, quickly on the, on the Article 50 revocation, uh, Catherine, for you, you'll be aware that um, 
the Scottish case is calling again before the inner house of the court session tomorrow, and they may wish to be addressed on what's the proper mechanism for revoking Article 50. And there's a debate between whether you would have to have an Act of Parliament to facilitate that or whether it could be done by a simple vote. What, what, what's your view? A vote of the House, that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, obviously, the Court of Justice doesn't uh, specify that. All it requires is it respects our constitutional requirements and that the intention to withdraw is un unequivocal and unconditional. Um, there is some hope that the Scottish Court might give us indication what our constitutional requirements might be. The choice is either it can be done by an executive act um, or it needs an act of parliament. Um, I think it would need to be an act of parliament because, um, it, not just because of Miller, but because um, we know from earlier case law that prerogative cannot be used to frustrate uh, the will of parliament as expressed in statute. And statute's actually spoken twice, first in the Notification um, Act. I think that's less problematic than uh, because of the rather general way it's, dra it's drafted that uh, it allows the Prime Minister um, the discretion she may notify um, her intention to withdraw. I think the more problematic one is actually the EU Withdrawal Act uh, 2018, yeah. which is much more detailed about us leaving the EU, in particular Section 1, which is the termination of um, the European Communities Act. So I think it needs to be done probably by an Act of Parliament. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Timms. Thank you. Oh, Catherine, I bring a, a question to you. I've heard you say <coughs> previously that you were aware of the existence of a longer draft of the political declaration than the one that was finally published. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, can you tell us anything uh, about that? Um, is it your impression that that document had a, a similar sort of direction of travel in it to the one that we've been talking about with the, the current political declaration? Do we know why? they went for a much shorter declaration um, in the end. Um, I, I've, I, I've been reliably told there was a much longer version, about 100 pages, um, doing, the, doing the rounds. I've not seen it. I don't think anyone, um, uh, apart from side, outside a very small circle, have, have seen it. My suspicion is it was hard enough to get um, the shorter version agreed and uh, sometimes um, less is more to try and get it through. And of course, the more detailed, the more information there is, um, the more that people have got time to pick over it. As it is, we can say 25 pages. My sense of it is it's a sort of Canada-type document is what we're heading towards. But as you've also heard, there is enough wriggle room in it uh, that it could be read to have some sort of Norway-style agreement to. W was it your impression that the longer version was probably a Canada-style direction as I, well? That's my understanding, but I don't know. Okay. Um, Henry, I think you're yeah, indicating. Yeah, I, I was the impression from speaking to people uh, inside government that there was a longer version that I think perhaps more explicitly set out a, a choice, a menu of different uh, options for the future relationship. Um, I think things moved around quite a bit towards the end, and clearly we saw, we've seen actually two published versions of the political declaration. So we saw the very short version yeah. that was published if, when the cabinet first agreed, um, and then a more substantive version after the, the council meeting. Um, and we know from uh, what the former uh, Brexit secretary said publicly that changes were made to the text in the immediate, uh, in the immediate period before it was published, um, and he felt those changes were substantive enough to encourage him to resign. But um, as he's pointed, I think, to areas where um, I think the language around building on the um, customs territory aspects and the level play playing field aspects, those then evolved a bit further in the period between the short political declaration being published and the final political declaration being published. Someone else? Yeah, I, was, I, mean, I, I, just, I just hesitate a bit on this, this Canada emphasis. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, there are... I think the reason the backstop is so problematic for some is that there, there is no deal that meets all the UK government and Theresa May's red lines. So if you go down Canada, you're only going to get joint agreement to go down the Canada route by having a, a border in the Irish Sea. Um, if you don't want to go down that route, then you go for a much deeper um, customs union model. And I, and I think... And, and that obviously then cuts across other red lines, but I, I think there is certainly quite a strong current of opinion that that is 
the, the way to go if, if Brexit goes ahead. And, and therefore, that's why, in my view, the political declaration very much points in both those directions, and that's an argument to be had again in the future. But I, I've no idea what the 100-page version did. Could it just on this, the existence of this longer draft of the political declaration, I appreciate no one's seen it, and there's a limit to what one can say about it, but is it your impression that this was something that the negotiating teams were reasonably happy with, and, and I suppose the politicians, when they looked at it, decided not to go that far? Or I mean, what was the status of the 100-page document? I didn't, I didn't know it was as much as 100 pages, but I think there were clearly things that were being looked at at negotiating level, and then some aspects of that. I don't know what, how much of that was locked down, how much of that was in the different colours that have been used. I, I wouldn't want to speculate more. Been the case that when you know at that very last late stage, the two weeks or so was spent putting the all UK customs union into the withdrawal agreement, and I think that may have then impacted on to going for the shorter political declaration. Okay, thank you. Can I uh, raise something completely different? This goes back to something you said earlier, Kirsty. You, mm. you said that the Commission has issued a document this morning. I, yes, which I, I haven't seen uh, <clears throat> about what they would do in the event of no deal. And you made the point in passing that, in, amongst other things, it doesn't say anything about data, about the arrangements mm. for data exchange mm. if we were to leave mm. with no deal. So can we take it from that that the Commission is saying that if the UK leaves with, with no deal, it will, from the 30th of March, be illegal to send personal data from anywhere in the EU to the UK? Is that... Well, I mean, I, what I said was only from, from some detailed media reports I read this morning. I don't, I don't know if they've just been well briefed or been leaked a copy of the document. Um, if they don't take any further steps, I suppose, yes, that is what it means. Um, I don't know what they'll say today. I, I think it's probably due out about now. Maybe the Commission is just meeting now on a Wednesday. Um, but it will be very interesting, not just on that issue, vital though it is, to see what they say about whether this is it or whether they're going to come out um, with other, other documents. Uh, you know, I understand why they're not saying anything about the Irish border, because it's extremely problematic politically, but I, I would expect them to, to return to data in, in some form. But maybe this is their kind of opening, opening pitch, and then they're going to wait to see how the UK responds. I just, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, just, just, just on that, because because it's not that it doesn't mention data. So it does mention data. I'm going off the November uh, paper that was sent from the Commission to the Parliament and and, and uh, Council that was a precursor to the legislation that's uh, being proposed today. And it does mention data. It says that existing provisions. Um, within different different rules and, and the like are adequate. And what it specifically says, though, is that they're not considering an adequacy arrangement at this time. So, so that's that, and a data adequacy arrangement. So that's that's what I'm led to believe we will see from the legislation that comes out. So it's not the data isn't mentioned; it's just on that specific point. Right, but but that would mean, would it not, that it would become illegal on the 30th of March to send personal data from the EU to the UK? Well, well it, not necessarily, because it depends on. Uh, the different provisions in, in in other areas to do with transfer of, of business within businesses and uh, and the, and the like, but but it's also still the case that the Commission could decide on the first of April to bring in place an adequacy arrangement. It yeah. just says that they're not considering it at this time. Yeah. But, but yes, it's, an, it's another potential cliff edge. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, Jeremy Lefroy. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to get your views on um, the difference, if any. Um, there would be in the ease or otherwise of negotiating future relationships, particularly around trade, in the case of a no deal as uh, against the agreement, the withdrawal agreement, political declaration, hence the transition period. Unquestionably, it would be easier if we um, have agreed to, uh, to leave through a deal. Um, and I think the, there are some suggestions, I think, in the papers today that if we left without a deal, we could withhold uh, financial settlement uh, with the European Union. Uh, obviously, the, if we did that, you know, we'd be all kind of open dispute on all kinds of matters. I think it'd be very hard to see the EU uh, engaging seriously with uh, with us on on trade. Uh, and, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. What the EU side mean by saying there's no managed 
no deal. Um, so not only are, are they taking unilateral measures, not agreeing bilateral measures for no deal, but the idea that, that you might pay some of the money or you might, from the UK side, you know, cherry pick the withdrawal agreement. I mean, the, why would the EU accept that? So the EU is, is presumably at that point going to say, we will negotiate with you when you accept the withdrawal agreement and then we would negotiate free trade. So if, if there's no withdrawal agreement, there are no trade negotiations. Not for quite some time. Yes, it's a que- it is a question of timing. So, so, so if we had a 10, 15, 20 year time horizon, I wouldn't rule out that after five, six, seven, eight years of there being no deal that we wouldn't start patching some things together. Of course, that is possible. But in terms of the immediate aftermath, is it, and I've heard this argument that we just leave with no deal and then immediately go to the table and start negotiating Canada. And, and it just seems ludicrous. The first thing the EU will say is, OK, you've come back to the table because you can't cope with no deal. That will be £40 billion, please, and a backstop for Northern Ireland. And those are our conditions of continued negotiation. It would be slightly more difficult than that because of the entire procedure on the EU side would change. But substantively, that's what would happen, and that's what they think will happen in the event of no deal, that the UK can't, won't be able to hack it for very long and will come back, and, and, uh, but, but in a much worse position than we are in now. Thank you. That's very clear and pretty much accords with my view. Um, the, the second uh, question I wanted to ask was, um, can you be realistic about what, if, if there is no deal, what the UK's trading position will be globally um, compared with all other countries around the world? Where will we sit in terms of our global trading relationships compared with not just other EU countries, but with any other country, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, China? Where will we be in terms of relationships? Got a report over in front say, of you, you gave me a chance to uh, mention a very fine report published by UK and the Changing Europe on um, what would trading on WTO terms mean. Um, I think the starting point, I'll, I'll be brief and then let's um, um, conclude, but um, what be- becomes very clear from this uh, report, um, which I'm very happy to provide you with copies of, of which, and they're easily available on the UK and Changing Europe website, is that um, very, very few countries indeed trade purely on um, just WTO terms. Uh, most countries have a whole range of bilateral agreements which uh, facilitate uh, the trade that occurs. Um, and uh, there are a handful of countries that um, aren't in the WTO with which the UK does do some trade, and they're Azerbaijan and Serbia. But in reality, the, the, the main countries that we trade with, well, obviously, um, 45% of our trading goods goes to the EU. Um, and so to be trading with them on purely WTO terms without any facilitation agreements of any sort would be very problematic. And, and just, just to, to, to conclude that, really, it's... Can you think of any other country in the world that doesn't have a preferential trading arrangement with the economic, regional economic superpower? And and the answer is no, because of course you do. Um, So so in terms of, I mean, you're asking us to rank countries against each other in terms of openness to trade or or, or, or something, or or in in terms of trading position. But we'd be in, in the event of no deal, we'd be in a hugely detrimental position. Not only do we lose on day one our relationship with the EU, we also technically lose our trade agreements with all other countries. And to go back to a point earlier, yes, I think some of them you could replace and, and the like, but it's not necessarily possible for all of them. For example, if we're not in a customs union with the EU, I cannot see how we replicate our trade agreement or customs union with Turkey. You know, we talk inevitably a lot in this discussion about trade and about the economy, but I think if the UK leaves with no deal, we have to think what damage that does to our international reputation as a state, and obviously that to some extent has already been damaged by the political stalemate here. Um, but I think you know, to, to leave without a deal, uh, reneging on, on many obligations and commitments as it would be seen, um, in terms of our foreign policy, our our security, our influence around the world, our ability to to be trusted in other crucial negotiations, you know, at a time of great global challenge and uncertainty, is it also needs to be factored into that rather extraordinary no deal picture. And then just my final question, if I may, Chairman, on this is in in the case of the no deal and hence having to um, 
keep not just one or two balls up in the air with the European Union, as we are at the moment, but with probably 180 to 190 countries, or at least the trading blocks in which those 190 countries uh, are, are at the moment, does the government have, or is it likely to have the capacity to deal with all that? So at the moment, we're just dealing with largely with the European Union and filtered through the European Union and a number of other countries. If we leave without a deal, we have to deal bilaterally with all those countries. Does government eat now or even in the future with this extra money um, allocated yesterday have that capacity, have that expertise? No, but they, 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 not to do all of those simultaneously, but obviously I think Sam was talking about replacing the existing EU's uh, deals. Some of those probably in terms of Canada and Switzerland are pretty much ready to be replaced in, for any... For any sort of, well, it's not ready yet, but I don't, my understanding is that it's, it's pretty advanced. Um, but Obviously, you wouldn't prioritise all countries equally. However, leaving, leaving without a deal, that would leave you with no deal at all with your biggest trading partner in goods, which is a very problematic position. So whatever else you did with any other trading partner in goods would be less helpful than having a trading arrangement with your biggest trading partner. Yeah, and, and I, I would add to that that the, the answer is no, but it's not really a criticism of the Department for International Trade whoever's, or whoever's leading, because some of these negotiations are being lead, led by different bits of government. The Foreign Office le leads on the association agreements, the DEXU on Turkey, EEA type, type negotiations. It's just a question of how, can you have that much capacity if you were to do them all at once? And the answer is probably not. So going to Henry's point, if we were to leave in no deal, you would have to prioritise. And, and, De and DIT and the like are already doing that to an extent. There's some agreements that matter more than others. But some are difficult in that they're not just trade. So the association agreements with North Africa have other elements. And the association agreement with Israel has research cooperation built into it. So, so, so it'd be inc it would be incredibly difficult. But one point I would make, because I think this sometimes comes up in the debate, one area where there isn't an issue, I don't think, is when it comes to our position at the WTO. Because this sometimes comes up as, a, as an issue. People say, well, we won't have our schedules ratified by the time we leave, and that could be a big problem in the WTO. In, rea in practice, that's not a problem. We would just apply at the board what we said we would and continue the discussion. So isn't there a, I think there is a domestic law problem in terms of getting the legislation through to be, oh, able, yes, to, to be able to set tariffs, both in terms of the primary legislation and the secondary legislation. So, so I'm talking about with regard to our relation to the rest of the world, yeah. um, not necessarily uh, domestic issues. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, Peter Bone. Um, when people voted in the referendum, of course, they didn't vote just about our trading relationship. In fact, probably that was not the most important issue. And the Prime Minister, I think, is right in saying that uh, people voted to control laws, money and borders. <coughs> Look, Chairman, the, uh, the panel has told us there's no majority in Parliament, or maybe no majority in Parliament, for anything. But surely that's not true. We've already had the Article 50 vote, with a huge majority in favour of that. We've had the EU Withdrawal Act with a huge majority, and Clause 1 is very clear in that Act, saying we're coming out of the European Union on 29th of March next year. So there is all, Parliament has already spoken. There is legislation and two huge votes. So surely coming out of the European Union on the 29th of March with a no deal gives a number of things. It gives control of our laws, money and borders, which the Prime Minister says is essential to honour the referendum, and I agree with that. And it gives what business wants, which is absolute certainty. The political declaration gives no certainty whatsoever. It gives a menu of different conflicting options. So can I just go back to um, the original comments of members to say that there's no majority for no deal and and isn't it actually a fact there is a majority for no deal because it's been voted for and isn't that exactly what the government should do to keep trust with the British people yeah. um, well I mean I, I, I made various statements about majorities obviously there have been majorities that have got us to this point um, the, the question is what what are their majorities for that we need urgently in the coming weeks, I would say, rather than months. And obviously, Theresa May decided not to hold the vote on the 11th of December. I think that was really unfortunate, I think, to wait another month when we're so near um, the 29th of March end date. It was, was, a, was a bad 
decision. Um, as we said earlier on this panel, the, the default, if there's no majority, um, as a result of those earlier majorities, will be a no deal exit. I, I think that's clearly not what business wants. There's uh, about but five. Skip, I think. Sorry, can I just Jen, on that? Since when, when do we give away the, when do we abolish the business vote? Wasn't it a hundred odd years ago? Surely we should be listening to the people, not just the business. I, I was responding to you saying that business wants certainty and that no deal would be certainty, and my response to that was to say that five business organisations today have come out saying they are very, very concerned at the preparations for no, de for no deal and therefore would prefer Theresa May's deal. I also think no deal doesn't give borders clarity. It will give you more like an, an borders control. It will give you borders chaos. So uh, at the moment, a number, of, a number of observers suggest if there's an active vote in Parliament, there wouldn't be a majority for no deal. But you're, certainly you're right. If, if, if I'm right and you're right, there was a majority for Brexit. If Parliament can't come together with a majority for, for either no, bre no Brexit or a deal Brexit, that will be the outcome. Okay, and Christopher Chair. Can I? Th th thank you, Chairman. The, there's a duty of the European Union for sincere cooperation, and that is an obligation that the EU has towards the United Kingdom as long as it remains a member of the European Union. So, can you help us as to how that duty applies in the circumstances between now and the 29th of March when we are preparing to leave? on WTO terms, because we have an absolute right under Article 50 to leave the European Union either with a deal or without a deal, and the default position, as we discussed, is to leave uh, without a deal. What obligation is there on the EU to try and make that easier uh, for everybody as, uh, under their duty of sincere cooperation? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's more a legal question. Politically, uh, I think uh, little obligation. And I think, you know, frankly, at the moment, politically, the UK is essentially seen as already a third country. And, and therefore, the sort, the sort of uh, cooperation and support that you see in, in the way the EU works across, across a whole range of areas um, to support its member states and, and, and get things to a consensus. Um, is, is, is probably no longer there, but that's a political comment, and I think you're asking more maybe about the... So it was, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so Article 4.3 of the TEU does contain the duty of loyal cooperation, and then in the Article 5 of the withdrawal agreement, you have a similar obligation of acting in good faith uh, to assist each other. The, the, the question is, how legally enforceable is that? What, what, what can we do if we think the EU is not actually... Uh, complying with that in some way. Now, uh, it would be at least theoretically possible for the UK government to start proceedings against uh, the Commission um, before the Court of Justice, but it will take some time. And the ECJ may well say that it's not um, a, a justiciable concept. It's not a concept that can actually be legally enforced. And it's it's often used, the, uh, the, the duty of law cooperation is used to try and facilitate other activities. And it may be what you're thinking of is Article 8, which is about the neighbourhood policy, because I've certainly heard it argued that um, the EU is under an obligation to facilitate a future trade deal because of the neighbourhood policy in Article 8. Now, if that is perhaps what's underpinning your question, then you're still up against the same legal problems, that the neighbourhood policy provisions are actually about uh, those countries uh, was, was drafted particularly against the backcloth of the Arab Spring and trying to facilitate um, relationships with countries in North Africa. Of course, that doesn't um, apply directly to us. And it's also thought not to be a legally enforceable provision, but it creates the context for uh, cooperative discussions, but probably not a lot more. And the EU could probably, in that context, argue that it has been trying to do that. It's agreed a withdrawal agreement at the technical level and it will then if the withdrawal agreement goes through to try and to negotiate a future relationship it can't it could legitimately say that it's down to UK intransigence from their perspective that this hasn't happened yeah but anyway, we're getting in the very last minute to do make these sort of legal challenges and I think overall the, the most important element of this was article 50 which places an EU law duty on the EU to negotiate and conclude an agreement with the UK they've done that as they see it so I don't I don't particularly see this as a as a very helpful route for us at this point. 
Well, it may not be, it may not be a helpful route for, for you, uh, but so surely <laughs> it's, it's incumbent upon the, the EU to demonstrate uh, that it is to be trusted. And, and uh, that's one of the big issues here. Yeah? A lot of people in the United Kingdom do not trust uh, the good intentions of, of the EU. And this is an example of it, isn't it? Because we, they have this obligation, but you just said uh, that it may not be enforceable in law. But, uh, uh, but surely there would be a, if it's not enforceable in law, there's still a moral obligation on them to do that. But you see, don't seem to be fussed about it. Can I ask you so, something slightly different? And that is that we keep talking about no deal. But what we heard as in this committee when we first went over to uh, Brussels was that they envisaged that the withdrawal agreement, the terms of the divorce, and the would be agreed, and the terms of the future relationship will be more than just the sketch that we got here, an ambiguous, self-conflicting sketch map. Uh, what we would have would be but the, the hard bones of a future trading relationship, which, as the f former Secretary of State said, could be signed off uh, within days of uh, the uh, new um, of, of, the, of the withdrawal having taken effect. And what we've now got is instead of that, we've got a, a deal in relation to the divorce, but we haven't got any deal at all in relation to the, the future uh, relationship. So it's, it's in a sense a misnomer to suggest that this is a difference between no deal and the deal, because the deal has no deal in it about the future. So um, we're, we're both, both options are unsatisfactory because they leave the future unknown, but it, and it would be wrong to suggest that one of those options leaves the future known when the other one doesn't. So, so I, I obviously can't speak to what, what you were told in, in your meetings in Brussels, but from the moment Article 50 was triggered, it has been my interpretation that we were negotiating the withdrawal, there would be a declaration of sorts on the future relationship, but that would be substantively negotiated after we've left. And you can even point to statements from Cecilia Malmström, the Trade uh, Commissioner at the time, that point to that. And when the former Secretary of State did make statements to that effect, I personally criticised him for it because I said, this isn't, you, you, you're, not, you're not conveying accurate information. And I feel that this, what I've just outlined, is a opinion, or at least an informed opinion, that's shared, I would imagine, by most of the panel, although I wouldn't want to speak for them. Uh, I, add, I mean, yes, I do. Obviously, from very early on, we, we heard that you, know, you can't do a trade deal until the UK becomes a third country. Um, you, you, know, you appear to be saying that somehow the EU has done something wrong. I think if the UK had come up with a clear demand for a specific trade policy early on, you know, that it wanted, the cabinet wanted, its backbenchers were behind, then, then maybe we would have got to the 100 pages and it might not have had firm bones because, again, legally that, that's probably not possible. You know, and, and a similar point on sincere cooperation is, is, you know, if the UK chooses to leave with no deal as opposed to the deal that's on the table, is that sincere cooperation? I don't think from well, the EU exactly side it would be 50. seen as such. That ultimately, I think you could have mounted an argument that under the terms of Article 50, the EU was required to agree something, a framework, I think is the language that's used, and the political declaration didn't quite meet that. We could have mounted that challenge. The former former Secretary of State uh, for the Department of Exeter in the EU suggested that there would be a, a huge fight over the phasing of the talks uh, in the summer of uh, 2017, I think it was, and we capitulated on that. I think that these passes were sold long ago, um, and it would have been, might have been possible to get something that's more substantive on a lot of these areas, but, but we're now uh, in the last can, can, can I take you back quickly to, to um, the Prime Minister's, um, not uh, the Lancaster House speech, <coughs> which was immediately after Article 50, Parliament had agreed to trigger Article 50. In that speech, she envisaged the possibility that the European Union would only give us what was described as a punishment deal. And she said in that speech that, as a result, no deal would be better than a bad deal. And she spelt out some of the advantages of no deal as including our ability to uh, be able to introduce fiscal and tax incentives for inward investment, which we might not otherwise be able uh, to do. And she even talked about the establishment of an alternative economic model as a way of showing that no deal would be better than a bad deal. 
What do you think the Prime Minister had in mind when she was talking about an alternative economic model as a, uh, one of the virtues and benefits that will come out of no deal? I, mean, I think the, the Chancellor also used similar language, uh, as I remember, in an interview um, where he took, sort of suggested the idea of a Singapore on Thames, but then r- rolled back from it. I think, of course, the UK could shift quite a lot of its economic model, but it's worth pointing out, by the way, that we could do a lot of that even in the backstop as well, which, where we would be able to substantially change our tax regime, for example, or our rules on uh, foreign direct investment. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, mythologisation about what Lancaster House actually said. For example, on the customs union, although it says that we'd be leaving uh, we believe in elements of the customs union. It also explicitly talks about association agreements on customs um, and not leaving all of the customs union and a sort of openness to a range of creative models. Uh, on, on no deal, obviously the, the Lancaster House position and the Conservative 2017 manifesto position was that no deal is better than a bad deal. But I would, I think that if you had a member of the cabinet here, they would argue that. Uh, they don't think it's a bad deal, and that's why they, why they approve the deal. Yeah, but surely that's the, it's the Parliament. If Parliament decides it's a bad deal, then isn't the logic for the Prime Minister to accept that the word of Parliament that it's a bad deal and then go back to her position, which is that no deal is better than a bad deal? Well, I think the default is that we leave without a deal unless we have a deal. No deal that's been discussed that's as bad as a no deal, and I think the result of, of proposing or hinting at a Singapore deregulated model has resulted in the negotiations in the EU being much tougher at various points on level playing field conditions and, and similar conditions. As because they're, fri- they're frightened of competition from us. That's what they're really frightened about. Well, uh, level playing field is about, is, is from their point of view, I think, would be about fair competition. And I think the political declaration talks about free and fair competition. It's the sort of phrase you'll find a lot in the EU documents that the UK has agreed Chairman, to. Chairman, can I just ask one other question? And that's about when we leave on the 29th of March, as I hope we do, with, without a deal on WTO terms, what will be the position physically on the Irish border? Will there be, uh, there won't be any um, physical barriers put up by the United Kingdom government because we said we won't do that, nor will they be put up by the Irish government because they said they won't do that. Are we expecting um, EU army tanks to be placed across that border or what are we expecting, if anything? It is a fair question. The answer is we don't know exactly. I'd imagine on day one, not so much would change. I think I mean, there's, there's no WTO inspectors, inspectors who are going to come and march down and start staking out a border. But the question is, and this, this falls into the emergency provisions uh, well, type it put, scenario. It could so, be Article so, 21 uh, on security as well, couldn't it? There's, a, there's an exception to, relating to security. moving over to an area that's outside of my expertise. But, uh, but on, the, on, on the trade side, could you have emergency provisions that allow this to remain open for a period of time? Yes. But is that sustainable in the long run? The answer is no, because you then have a situation whereby goods exiting the UK and entering the EU from any other destination faces all of these controls, but don't there. So it's not a sustainable long-term solution to say, well, we won't do anything, because after a while, either side, either the UK or the EU side, will have to start putting in controls, because otherwise you have a back door into each other's markets. And then I think there's a bigger question on this. People just focus on the stakes or the infrastructure or the like, and there's a problem in Northern Ireland from the moment we leave without a deal because the terms for the people living there have changed. You have, they have become distinct. People in the North who thought of themselves as Irish are, are suddenly concerned, OK, maybe that's changed, maybe something's going on. So I think we do focus on the economic and trade issues when it comes to Northern Ireland quite a lot, but the backstop goes much further beyond that. The aim is to make sure nothing has changed, practically speaking, for the people yeah. living there. And in a no-deal scenario, it would have done, if only to begin with, the increased uncertainty over their position. But nothing would have changed on the border? Well, not necessarily. I, 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 just, I just laid out a scenario where that could not be the case on day one. But it's in terms of the long term, then yes, absolutely things would change on the border. Yes, and I think we can't say for sure. As I, as I mentioned quite a bit earlier, you know, there will be very serious discussions amongst the EU27 at, at that point. I mean, the EU is a peace project um, above all else, but it's also a trading bloc. It has an external border. It would, it would create a very difficult situation, and I don't think the, the result would simply be borders as now. There, there would be change. OK. Well, you've been very patient and generous with your time, but as I said at the beginning, we had lots of stuff to cover, and I think... 
who has done so. And on behalf of the committee, can I express our profound thanks to you for giving up your time today and to wish you, since this is the last session of the committee, a very, very happy Christmas. Same to you. And an interesting you New Year. Order, order. <laughs>